Okay, Doug, I do believe we are good to go. We are recording. I pushed recording. Does anybody see that little red button? Yes. Okay, because I don't see it. Um, the attendees are coming in. We do have somebody on iPhone 13. I know that we have a presenter, Bob Parent, joining us. That may be him. Um, you have a quorum of the board. My clock says 634. I think we're good to go. All right, thanks, Pam. Sorry, everyone, to interrupt the Zamers Media. Um, may, can we just wait five minutes? I just want to double check something. For those of you uh, of the public attendees, we are waiting for Amherst Media to check something and get back to us that we're good to go. All right, everyone, thanks for waiting. We're good to go. All right, Pam, you're good? Yes, I am good. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of June 26, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.36 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live streamed via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colton. I'm here. Uh, Fred Hartwell. I am here. Jesse Major. Present. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Uh, we've been told Janet McGowan will be arriving late. Uh, she is not here yet. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment 
regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the time now is 6.39. First item on our agenda are the meeting minutes. And uh, I did not see any minutes in our packet. Is that correct, Chris? That is correct. We're missing May 1st, May 15th, and June 5th. Um, as you know, we've been stressed because we lost a staff member, but we will try to catch up by the next meeting. All right, great. All right, so now we'll go to the public comment period. And at this time, I usually read the names of the public I see. Uh, we have eight attendees, uh, Bob Parent, Constantine Fleshikov, someone with iPhone 13, uh, Jeff LeBeau, Jen Ducharme, Maura Keen, Melissa McGowan, which I may have misspelled or mispronounced, and Miriam Sierra. Do any members of the public want to make a comment at this time on something, on a topic that is not later on our agenda this evening? All right, I don't see any hands raised uh, from members of the public. This will go on. All right, time is 641 and we'll go to item three on the agenda, which is our public hearing for this evening. <clears throat> this is a combined hearing, site plan review and a special permit. So, all right, so in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. It is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This is SPR 2024-10, and SPP 2024-505. Applicant is the town of Amherst. Location is East Pleasant Street at Kendrick Park. Request a site plan review approval under section 3.335 of the zoning bylaw, public park, playground, or other public recreation facility to install a prefabricated restroom structure on a concrete pad along the north Pleasant Street side of the park and request a special permit under footnote A of table three of article six of the zoning bylaw to modify the front setback requirement from 15 feet to 10 feet. Parcel 11C-244 in the RG zoning district. Do we have any members of the, of the board who would like, who need to make a disclosure before this hearing? I am not seeing any hands raised in response to that, so I will assume there are no board disclosures. So uh, we'll go right into the applicant presentation, and then after that, we'll have our site visit report. Uh, Bob Parent, I assume you're here as the applicant? Yes, I am. All right, so welcome, and you may proceed. Very good. Thank you. For those that don't know me, I came on board with the town about a year ago in a a uh, uh, position called Special Capital Projects Coordinator, just to help the town move 
uh, a number of different capital projects forward like this one. Um, so I've been asked to, um, again, to take on responsibility for this project and move it forward. It's a relatively straightforward project. If I, let's see, I think I can share my screen. grab the right you should be able to see a site plan right now i believe yes so the plan that i've shared with you if you look at the bottom center more or less of the plan it shows the proposed location of the uh restroom facility it's a proposed uh single unit unisex facility prefabricated as as you indicated um to be located on a concrete pad adjacent to what will be a new sidewalk um, and I expect we'll hear about that a little bit in the in the site visit report but um, North Pleasant Street is under construction right now for a DPW designed um, and implemented project that will include a number of different things included um, a new sidewalk new angled parking on the northern portion of North Pleasant Street etc um, and what we're requesting and have been working with the DPW to do is to locate this new restroom facility adjacent to the proposed new sidewalk. Um, so if you see that that gray uh, kind of oblong shape, that's the restroom facility. The sidewalk is immediately to the west of that. And because of the location of the sidewalk and the position of the restroom facility, that's the reason that we're requesting the special permit. Uh, the zoning setback in this zone would normally be a 15 foot setback to locate the restroom facility immediately adjacent to the sidewalk. As you see here, um, we would only be approximately 10 feet from the sidewalk. So that's one of the reasons we're in front of the planning board this evening uh, to request that approval. Um, to Put this location somewhat in context, tongue context, uh, I believe you can see an overall site plan of Kendrick Park. Uh, the green oval that you see in the middle is the new playground that was constructed several years ago. The dark uh, gray or black line you see on the top or the east side of North Pleasant Street is the new sidewalk improvements that are being constructed as part of the North Pleasant Street improvements. Um, it seemed to be an ideal location for a restroom, one to serve the park, uh, particularly during the, 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 the daytime hours, as well as to serve some of the nearby commercial establishments uh, that have activities that go into the evening and to provide a restroom uh, that's open to the public uh, during the evening hours as well. The, if I can get my... What we're proposing to have constructed this location is based on a product uh, that's known as the Portland Lou, which I believe you can see in the screen right now. Um, it's a product that's been in manufacturing for probably six to nine years, I believe. It was originally implemented in the city of Portland, hence the name the Portland Lou. Uh, and then the manufacturing company that uh, originally constructed these for the city of Portland I believe was then licensed to be able to sell this product uh, elsewhere and now has several hundred installations across Canada as well as the US. In coming up with this as a type of facility, um, we met uh, both the town manager, fire department, police department, myself and the building commissioner to talk about a couple of different alternative types of facilities. And we settled primarily on this facility uh, to address uh, public safety concerns. You know, it's a fully private facility, but it is at the same time a facility that can be viewed from the exterior. Um, and one of the major concerns that public safety officials have is, you know, the potential for what might happen or be ongoing in a closed building that they have no, uh, you know, no access to or not no access to, but no visibility of. So this seemed like an ideal uh, fit where you have louvers at the bottom of the facility, as you can see in the photograph, and then at the top of the facility that provide visibility in terms of uh, what 
and and sort of who in terms of, of, of you know, is it a single person or possibly multiple people inside of the facility, as well as, you know, if something happened and somebody fell onto the floor of the facility or something like that, that would clearly be visible from the outside of the facility uh, to any public safety officials uh, that respond to the site. Um, another thing that we liked about this is it it's really, you know, it, it's proven itself, you know, with the hundreds of installations that are located that are built specifically for this purpose, as opposed to something that might be custom designed or custom manufactured that really hasn't worked all the bugs and the kinks and everything else out of the product. This is a product that, again, has been used in a number of different areas. The city of Greenfield recently installed one. Um, if you're familiar with the parking lot areas behind what used to be the, the Wilson's department store, uh, there's there's one of the facilities there now adjoining where the skate park is and the parking lot is. City of Cambridge has several um, that come to mind, and, and there's several other in Massachusetts that are either in or are planned to be in. The facility is, from a restroom facility, pretty straightforward. Um, it, it, it has a, a toilet inside. Um, it has a wall-mounted changing table on the inside of the facility. Um, it is fully handicapped accessible. Um, the hand washing station is actually located on the outside of the facility, uh, so as not to take up space on the inside. And because we're in a cold weather environment, the way that that is dealt with um, is by heat tracing the plumbing, the drain, and the supply lines uh, so that the piping doesn't freeze in the wintertime. Um, let's see, what else do I want to mention? One thing I did want to note, on some of the photographs in here, you'll see that there's a large Portland Lou decal that's located on, on, on the unit. They no longer ship units with that large decal on there. The only, the only signs or decals that come on the facility are the ADA compliant signage on the outside of the facility. Um, and then on the top, you can't see it in this photograph, but you can see it in some of the other photographs. Uh, there's a, a large letters that say public restroom to identify the purpose of the building. The unit that we intend to purchase and procure and purchase um, will actually be a hybrid powered system. It will have solar panels on the roof, but it will also have a connection to um, the, the electrical system, uh, primarily to make certain that we have adequate levels of, of power during the wintertime, uh, that the typical solar panels that are mounted on a facility would be adequate to with a battery system here to, to handle the lighting um, inside the facility, but in a cold weather climate, they're not adequate to power the heat tracing that's necessary uh, to keep the piping from freezing. I will note that the restroom itself is not heated, um, but the, the piping and the plumbing is heated as necessary to, to keep things from freezing. I can show you a couple of photographs quickly. Again, this is one that shows what they used to furnish the unit with, with a large Portland Lou decal on the end of the unit. They no longer ship them with that. The color you do see here, and I know I expect we'll be talking about color tonight, is the, the standard color and the standard coating product that they recommend that they've had the greatest success with in terms of being uh, graffiti resistant. Um, they will use any type of custom color that you might want to put onto the unit, um, but they're not as confident in the graffiti resistance of other painting systems than the one that they typically use all the time. Um, the other thing, this is the one in the city of Cambridge. Again, the decal would not be in the, in the town's facility. This is actually the facility being installed in Greenfield uh, this last fall. Um, You can hit uh, it, this. This photograph shows one of the color options that communities have chosen. It's a beige or brown color, so it is feasible. Um, again, it's not the recommended, but it's feasible, and it certainly you can get graffiti resistant paint. It just may not have the track record of the painting system that uh, the manufacturer customarily uses. Again. You know, some some nice looking facilities from my perspective, the brown, you know, fitting into this environment works pretty well. Some interesting things that some communities have done, and I have a couple of examples of this, is that 
they go with the standard uh, gray color, but then they apply a vinyl wrap to the exterior of the restroom facility. Um, and some of them have gone as far as to make it part of a public art or a public art competition, you know, where the winning artist gets selected uh, to put their design on the exterior of the restroom facility. Here's another example. Another example. There is one case uh, where actually a similar type of treatment was done, and this gives you a view of the inside of the restroom facility uh, with, with a vinyl decal on the interior of the restroom uh, to help dress that up. And that certainly would be feasible as well if that's something that the town wanted to do. The vinyl wrap would be something that would be done after installation. It wouldn't be done by the restroom manufacturer, but it's something that the town would procure or could procure locally uh, to have installed, uh, similar to some of like the, the signage material that you see on bus buses these days. That's actually a vinyl material that gets applied to the exterior of the of the transit bus. Uh, I've got more details that go into exactly how it's constructed, but I I think that covers most everything. Um, if I can go back up a little bit, I do want to talk about a couple of items that you might have questions about. One is lighting. Uh, the lighting that is provided with this unit is a combination of interior and exterior lighting. The interior lighting is blue. And you might, if you wonder why the interior lighting is, is blue, it's because it tends to deter some illicit activities that might occur inside of the restroom. Um, folks looking to identify a vein, for instance, uh, will have a hard time seeing that in a blue lighting condition. So this is a case where, again, we've got a facility that has been put into a number of urban environments over the years and has really been fine-tuned and tweaked to try to minimize the problems that can result from making something like this accessible to the general public. Um, the restroom facility will have uh, timed locks on them, uh, and they will be tied into the town's fiber network such that the lock time can be modified as desired. We haven't established a specific time that's really going to be something that will have to be worked out in the future. But I would anticipate that the restroom facilities wouldn't stay open all night, but they would likely be open until the late evening, you know, perhaps early morning or something like that, and then shut down for some period of time and then reopened automatically in the morning. Um, maintenance of, of a facility is always an issue, and similar to what the DPW does now with the restroom facilities at uh, several town parks, uh, we would likely retain an outside contractor to complete the maintenance of the facilities. And we would expect to have a firm um, coming on site at least twice a day, if not three times per day. Because in order to keep the facilities really up to standard, it does require a regular level of maintenance. Um, and actually, I was going to talk about lighting as well. The exterior lighting um, is a rope like lighting that gets hung in the overhang of the unit. It's only a 12 watt um, LED. So it's not intended to throw a lot of light away from the facility. It strictly shines down and kind of washes the, the face of the unit. Um, and it actually, the, it dims when the unit's in use. So there's actually a, a, a lighting indication of the, of the unit being occupied or not being occupied, but it's very low, as I said, 12, 12 uh, watt um, tucked up underneath that just uh, washes the face of the building. And let's see, I think that's everything that I wanted to cover. As I said, I know color will be a, will be a concern. Um, and, you know, we, I work for the Conservation Development Department, work under Rob Moore. I don't think we're particularly set on any particular solution in terms of color, but we would like to come up with something that is low maintenance uh, and is not problematic for the town. And if ultimately there were strong preferences uh, to go with a particular color, we wouldn't oppose that. All right. Thank you, Bob. Uh, board members, I guess I'll open it for comments. Jesse. Thanks, Doug. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, first one is about the location. So on our on our site visit, uh, 
it struck me that it's it's right now where it is on the plan, assuming we were standing in the right place, it's in a very open space. So there are some clusters of trees nearby, but it's right between those. And as just a feature in the park, I was wondering what went into that decision rather than trying to tuck it into other visual things that are already happening. Because as it is now, I think it, it's pretty standalone, not near any of the large trees, very apparent. So maybe you could just tell us about the location choice. Certainly, and and I think you can see the photograph that I pulled up that um, shows where the proposed location is. It is by design located in an open space, but effectively as close to the street as we can make it at this point, not in the center of the park, so it might impact future use of of the open area. So we are trying to trying to leave as much of the park unimpacted as possible. Um, and also not looking to impact any of the large mature trees that are there. So we did want to get it out into an open area, um, and we did want to put it in an area where uh, the solar panels had the opportunity to receive as much light as they possibly could. But depending on the time of day and the time of year, you know, they may be partially shadowed even at this location, um, but it, it would be much more effective than locating it underneath a tree where again we have a risk of damaging the tree as well as not operating as effectively thanks um so i realized that i should have had the site visit report before we got into questions and answers um so three of us uh, met chris breastrup out there yesterday jesse fred and i um, Jesse and Fred, do either of you want to do a site visit report? All right. Well, I can say that uh, the three of us met out there with Chris, and we stood approximately where it is uh, proposed to go on the site. And, uh, you know, the street at the moment, North Pleasant Street along that section is under to uh, total reconstruction. Uh, Chris described where the sidewalk was going to be introduced and added as a part of that project. We did discuss a little bit the, the angled parking that was going to be coming as part of that street reconstruction. Um, I think that's most of what I, we did look at the drawings for the, for the loo itself. Um, Chris mentioned, I think that, uh, the DRB had been interested in maybe not using a standard color, but she did also mention what Bob has said about uh, this particular gray being the, the most proven graffiti resistant color that the manufacturer was offering. So that's my take on the site visit. Uh, Jesse or Fred, do you either of you wanna add anything? Fred. Yeah, this is <clears throat> not from the uh, actual site plan visit, but something that occurred to me subsequently, and that is whether any uh, discussion, I'm, I'm curious uh, if uh, there have been any consideration of locating this closer to the active play area. Um, I uh, have been to this park a number of times with my now six-year-old grandson, uh, who has figured out how to pee in the in the, amongst the trees. But um, it's quite a walk from the active playground to where this is positioned, and I'm wondering if that's practical or what consideration was given to that. Bob. Certainly. Let me see if I can get back to kind of the overall plan there. So <clears throat> so it, it is probably in the order of uh, 150, 200 feet. I haven't measured it specifically, but it's, you know, it's not immediately adjacent, the playground. Um, I believe when they located the playground, they did a very good job of tucking it into the existing uh, trees that were located in the area. I believe they only had to take down a couple of trees and were able to keep most of the very large trees that were located there. And, and for that reason, 
I would would still have the concern about impacting those trees if we were to um, bring a structure too close to them. Uh, this does require um, underground utilities. It does require uh, installing a frost wall, four foot deep, you know, frost wall for the unit to sit on. Um, so we would have the potential to be impacting roots and root systems um, as, as part of the installation. Um, so, and it, it is a little bit of a, you know, it, yeah, it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, the restroom isn't intended to serve the playground only, you know, certainly if it was only desired to, you know, maybe close would be good, but again, you know, people have different ideas about privacy and, you know, if it's good to put a restroom facility right immediately, you know, adjacent to a group of users, you know, of, of another facility, or is it better to put it at a somewhat remote location, not remote, but a little bit further removed and, and perhaps, you know, maybe have a little bit more privacy. I, again, I, I don't really know, but that's the, that was really primarily, we we're looking for the open space. We were looking to keep it as far out of the park as possible so that we didn't impact any future development um, and, and, and put it on a location that was very accessible. Uh, to anybody that needed to use it. All right. Um, Bruce. Um, I had the same thoughts initially um, as uh, Fred, but when, Bob, when you said what you said about uh, trying to keep it out under the trees, not just for the uh, adverse impact of the excavations, not just for the foundation, but also the the water line is going to go down four or five feet too, so that's another uh, thing that happens. Uh, I, I I thought that with that and, and the need to get natural and and uh, and solar energy in, it it all seems as though you've thought about this pretty uh, pretty carefully. And I also thought that uh, this is what, uh, in terms of the product you've selected and the way you've described it and so forth, this is what good design looks like. Um, so I'm uh, very uh, positive about this. I think uh, Bob, you and your colleagues have, have done very well. And I really don't, I mean, I had a whole bunch of questions, not a whole bunch, a couple, and then they progressively went away. And so what I have left is really just uh, um, my compliments to uh, what I think, what appears to me to be a job well done. So, uh, and I think uh, all I would add is that I think the, the gray does sound like the appropriate color here. It's it's a uh, gray is quite uh, fashionable these days among the millennials, it seems. But nonetheless, I think it will. Um, it, it it's it's a color that probably will in that area recede. And I I think if it's uh, also the color that the the surface that is most graffiti resistant. Um, and it sounds like these people know what they're talking about when they've done their design and development of this product. So I think it would be prudent for us to uh, adopt that particular gray color. That's it for me. Thank you. Okay, Bruce, Jesse. Thanks. Um, I had, I guess, some questions about, I mean, you said the timing of it being open is to be determined. I'm quite familiar with the activities there day and night on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I would imagine if it's left open those nights, it'll be pretty overrun by dozens, if not hundreds of excited young people every evening. And so so I assume that's been part of the conversation. Like, can it, I mean, I know it's been installed in urban places and I'm sure it's very heavily used, um, but does that have implications for how it's managed and if it should be left open? Is that part of the conversation? And I'm not sure that's appropriate for planning board right now, but, um, yeah, I was just really curious how that's going to be handled. I can imagine needing nightly calls by, I don't know if it's police or fire to help when someone's locked in there and not responsive or who knows what. Um, is It looked like in one of the pictures there was a little call or a red alarm feature in there. Is that standard? And yes. that's 911 box or something? It's not tied into the 911, um, but I can check with IT to see how... Um, what what could be brought back i don't you know typically fire department master boxes are a st kind of a standalone um, er emergency response system um, but i can double check both with it as well as um, the fire department to see what they might recommend um and really i was just curious about those those aspects 
because I, I think it'll be very heavily used if it's left open, you know, starting at 7 to 2 a.m. There's hundreds of kids lined up at the spoke, frankly speaking. I would run across the street to use it. And Thanks. that's one of the trade-offs there, you know, given the the alternative, are you, would you, you know, is it better to have no facility available? I, it's, All right. It's no, I, I, tricky, sorry, know. I should have started with, I think it's a great idea. Uh, I guess just the management of when it's open might be a, a larger conversation. Right. That's all. All right. Uh, I don't see any more hands at the moment, so I'll ask at least a couple questions. Um, it, is this a, uh, the kind of toilet that makes a sort of whoosh when it operates? Yes, but not to the extent I just got off of a cruise. It's not to the extent if you're, if you're flushed on cruise ships, for instance. You know, they're loud. You know, they'll wake everybody up in the middle of the night, for instance. It's, it's, uh, but I don't believe it's much different. It's a, you know, it's, it's, well, I'd love to say that I flushed one. I have not flushed one. So I don't have any firsthand experience. Um, okay. All right. But I well, do I guess... imagine they'll create a noise, but nothing like a, a very loud jet type flush that yeah. you see at some locations. Uh -huh. Doug, if, if I could interject, it's, it seems as it's a gravity-fed thing. So really, right. the whoosh would simply be the uh, the, the flush the, the, the flush valve, but there's no uh, there's no pressure or uh -huh. suction involved in this, okay. right? Uh, it's just it's a gravity it's a gravity thing. Correct. Okay, good. Well, um, I guess I'm wondering how critical is it to be so close to the sidewalk, and you know, having just come out of my uh, planning board reappointment interview where I was asked about waivers and you know what my attitude is about waivers. Uh, why do you actually need to be 10 feet rather than 15 feet away? I don't complete I, it's not obvious to me. And I would think if there's any serious pedestrian traffic on this sidewalk, you might want some separation from the sidewalk as well as from the playground. It, it certainly could be moved further away. Right now, I believe we have about six feet of clearance off the face of the unit to the sidewalk itself. It's a wide sidewalk. It, the sidewalk itself is eight feet wide, so we'd be about six feet from the sidewalk and 14 feet from the opposite side of the sidewalk. Um, we could certainly make the pad larger. Um, it would just be more concrete, more impervious area, more, um, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And not a significant expense. It just didn't seem to be necessary, quite honestly. Uh huh. Well, I don't know how folks feel about this particular waiver, but it, I'm not, I'm not clear on really what the purpose is, other than to save a few cents on a concrete connection. Nate, maybe you know. Yeah, I, I was thinking it's it's two things. One is, you know, visibility for police when they drive by so they can see into it. And then the other one is, um, you know, there's a bigger plan for Kendrick Park. And so uh, I'm just going to share my screen. And so where this was located is right, um, people can see my cursor right here. Yeah. Um, is it right about here, actually? And so, you know, the idea was that if this could be more of an open lawn, amphitheater, or whatever programming space, I mean, you don't want to push, you know, push the that structure too far into the green space. And so I think there was some consideration about, you know, if, you know, Kendrick Park is, you know, continue to be built out in phases, you know, where is, where is the least impact to future design? And so. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's helpful information. I didn't wasn't aware of that. Um, I guess uh, we've talked a little bit about the color and I noticed, uh, Chris, you included at least three different minutes from the uh, design review board where they had had comments and color was part of their conversation. Um, the last one suggests that they we're going to continue talking about this in July. I don't think they really will continue to talk about it. Um, the only thing that they might talk about is in any kind of signs. Um, 
but my impression was that they voted. In fact, I think the draft minutes of the last meeting um, show that they voted to recommend the beige color, even though they had talked about the green color. Okay. Um, we did provide photographs of those two colors that are currently being used in Kendrick Park. I don't know if Pam can bring that those mm. photographs up or not, um, but both of those colors were acceptable to the DRB, mm. but they favored the uh, beige color, but they didn't have the information about um, the graffiti resistance. So mm -hmm. that was something that was just brought to my attention this week mm -hmm. by Bob Parent, and I didn't know about that before. Mm. Bear with me. I'm not seeing any of my uh, documents. Hold on. Closed. Chris, you should keep talking because I have to try to reload the packet. And hold on. Okay, maybe Nate could bring it up. Nate is a whiz about bringing things up, like by magic. Well, if I have a minute, I can do it. Yeah, yeah. Is that the, you know, are you trying to show the do more colors that match the benches, Chris? Yeah, well, we had an image of the bench and, yeah. and an image of the picnic table in the packet. So if someone yeah. can get to the packet, you could show it. Yeah, sorry. So um, I'll just, if, if that's if my screen, oh, is my screen visible for everyone? Yes, yes. it is. Yep. Yeah, so the um, we use do more uh, site furnishings. And so in the park, we have uh, Sudan here um, for the benches and the tables are a green. And so at first, you know, the DRB was recommending, you know, a, something green, um, but, you know, we're recommending more of this neutral tone here. Um, and so I, I could I could jump to the packet, but you know these are standard colors for site furnishings. We use black for for trash cans typically, um, and so that's you know these are the it's the range right here. Mm -hmm. So uh, the gray that Chris was talking about that's uh, the graffiti resistant color from the manufacturer is that does that correspond? To so that's different than Sudan and the green colors. It is. Um, and Nate, you used the word recommended that you were recommending the Sudan. Is that uh, Chris? Do you share that? Is that is that in oh. fact a recommendation? Because that that's different than kind of I'd gotten oh. the impression. Yeah, I wasn't recommending that. I think Chris had mentioned the DRB. You know, thought about green, but then they were saying, "Oh, maybe the color of the furnishings would be," you know, after their memo had been developed. Uh huh. Yeah, it looks like Pam's going to be able to bring up those photographs of the actual colors of the items in the park. Oops. So this one has, if you scroll down, this is the beige color. It's kind of a dark beige, and this is the color of the benches in Kendrick Park, mm -hmm. um, at least around the playground. And then um, there's also a an image of the picnic table, which is a round picnic table with chairs. And it's a kind of a dark green. I think it's called forest green. Is that right, Nate? Yeah. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if we, I, you know, I like the idea of the graffiti resistant, you know, from the manufacturer, I think that color will recede as opposed to having a brighter color or some other color. And so, you know, I you know I will say that even the local historic district it doesn't regulate color necessarily. So, um, I, I I would try something that's probably you know better long term for operation and maintenance and not, you know, and it's the color all inside and outside, right, Bob? I mean, it's it's the whole thing. So it's like, you know, to me there could be some cost savings to go with a standard one as well. There would be from a cost, and you're correct. It is interior and exterior. If you have any sort of custom paint, uh, typically the manufacturer has to buy that in certain lot sizes. And many times they don't actually fully utilize the full lot. So whereas the, 
the the paints that they 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 customarily use they can use them on another installation versus something that's customized just for the town so if you were asking me for my recommendation i think someone did ask me that i would prefer to go with the gray i think it will work just fine and it will recede into the landscape it's kind of a dark color and we all know that black tends to recede so um Personally, I think the gray will call less attention to itself, and it is um, graffiti resistant, which I think has a lot of uh, merit. Okay, thanks. Um, Bob, I was going to ask about the grading around the concrete pad. Is is the grade going to be flush with the concrete, or is it possible that there'd be a little bit of a drop off there that somebody wheelchairs might fall off or something? Uh, you know, typically you try to set a concrete pad up, you know, minimally probably a half an inch or so. You, you put some sort of a chamfer or bevel in the concrete. If you don't, you know, you you have an issue potentially with uh, soil migrating onto the concrete. So you typically want to set it up just a little bit, but it's, you know, we're, we're well in excess of ADA, you know, uh, sidewalk widths in terms of getting around the facilities. Yeah, I just, I just don't yep. want to have somebody accidentally roll off the edge and right. not be able to get back on. If, you know, if the, if the drop was six inches, I'd be worried. Right. No, it wouldn't be. It's the site is essentially flat. We would fit it to, to the existing grade, as I said, but probably have it up slightly higher than the, than the surrounding ground. Okay. All right. Um, well, why don't we see, are there any public comments on this proposal? We have, we still have seven attendees. Do any of you want to make a public comment about this proposal? All right, not seeing any hands. All right. Um, so, uh, Bruce, you've been pretty positive about the proposal, and um, I haven't heard much from Johanna or Karen or Fred. Um, I know, Fred, you did ask a question or two. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll make one last call for, for questions or comments from some of the rest of you, but otherwise I see, uh, Bruce, you've, you've had your hand up, but I suspect to make a motion. And, That's uh, correct, yes. And so maybe Johanna. Johanna, oh, maybe. you put your hand up. Are you here to second or are you here to ask a com question or make a comment? Well, you're soliciting questions and comments. I don't have a ton of questions, but my comment is that this seems like a need and it seems like a pro product that is well designed for the need and um yeah that's a, i guess my reaction okay all right great okay bruce you still have your hand up you want to make a motion we've we've got uh yeah. both a special permit and a site plan review so we're going to need a couple of different motions i think oh you want to do two of them Chris well, has her hand up. And Chris, Chris you, you've got your hand up. What what am I missing here? Well, we did prepare um, findings and conditions. Do you mm -hmm. want to look at those before Bruce um, okay. makes his motion? Good. Yes, yes, probably. I I didn't see those, and I was, but it seemed to be so straightforward that uh, an almost unconditional approval. I mean, except for the standard boilerplate conditions. But uh, let's have a look. And so. Pam, you want to bring those up? So there are conditions that are um, <clears throat> pretty much the standard boilerplate conditions. Um, and the finding for the site plan review would be that it meets the relevant criteria of section 11.24. But then for the special permit, you have to find that it, um, you, you have to make findings with regard to footnote A. So um, if you can scroll down, the proposal, this this would be a, a draft finding. The proposal does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have a functional or visual relationship thereto. The proposal for a 10-foot setback for the prefabricated public 
restroom structure rather than a 15 foot setback is in keeping with the landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood because it allows the proposed sidewalk along the street to also provide easy access to the public restroom structure. The proposed sidewalk will then continue on to the north to connect to the existing pathway to provide access to the playground. So that was my best guess at what you might use for a finding. Right. Well, I think it's worth mentioning in this that it's consistent with the long range plan for the for Kendrick Park by uh, keeping it out of a future area that's proposed to be open uh, for public gathering. It's consistent with maintaining uh, a high degree of solar illumination and radiation for the PV and the natural lighting uh, dome. And it's consistent with uh, uh, minimizing damage to existing uh, mature trees. Bob? I believe reviewing the discussion of the site plan approval of Kendrick Park, I believe there were significant comments about a desire to have a restroom facility um, adjoining the park or available to the park as part of that approval. So I would say it's also consistent with what the board had previously discussed in the context of that, that site plan approval. Uh, all of that would be uh, fine with uh, a motion that I might uh, be about to make. <laughs> you might, huh? <laughs> Unless you cut me off. <laughs> Okay, if you so, allow me. Well, let, let's let's see if Chris got most of that. Mm -hmm. I did. Yep. Pam, right, between so, Pam and me, we've got mm -hmm. it. Yep. All right. All yeah. right. So in that case, I guess, uh, not seeing any other hands, Bruce, why don't you continue into your motion? Well, uh, should I do it as two separate? Yeah, uh, I think we should do a okay. plan review. Um, so a uh, move that uh, the board approves uh, site oh, plan. Actually, what? Were there any other parts of the conditions for the site plan review? Can you scroll up, Pam? Yes. Yeah, so did, built I substantially think... in accordance with the plans, managed substantially in accordance with the plans. Then um, changes would be brought back for the planning board to decide whether they need to file a new site plan review application um, it expires within two years. <clears throat> Work should be completed within 24 months, and all exterior lights should be downcast. So those are pretty standard. Okay. And uh, and it complies with uh, section 11.24 as a as a finding. Yeah. All right, Bruce, go ahead. I try so, not to uh, interrupt you. No, that's fine. I'm I'm I love support. Uh, move that the board approve uh, SPR 2410. Uh, the town of Amherst Kendrick Park restroom uh, with the draft possible uh, with the uh, conditions as drafted and the findings as drafted uh, and to um, close the public hearing, I guess. All right. Johanna. I'll second that motion. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, any more comments from the board or public attendees? I do not see any. All right. So we'll go ahead and do a roll call. So starting with you, Bruce. Aye. Fred? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Um, Johanna? Aye. Uh, do we still have Karen? Um, Karen, if you are there. Ah, uh, I, I agree. Thank you. I'm an I as well. And Janet is not with us yet, I believe. Okay. Um, would anybody else like to make the second motion? Otherwise, Bruce, go right ahead. Uh, move that the board approve special permit uh, uh, SPP 2405 Town of Amherst Public, uh, McKendrick Park Public Restroom uh, with the findings as uh, drafted and, uh, and discussed. 
um, and uh, that we close the public hearing. All right. And uh, Chris, do we need to state that there are no no conditions? I that would be fine if you wanted to state that. Yep. All right. I'm happy to include that in the motion. Okay, Jesse. Second the motion. Great. All right. Uh, I guess unless I see any more hands, we'll go right into that vote. Um, starting with Karen. Aye. And Johanna. Aye. And Jesse. Aye. Fred. Aye. And Bruce. Aye. And I am an I as well. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Bob, for bringing the project to us and good luck. Very good. Thank you. All right. Okay, so the time now is 7.29. We can go to the next item on the agenda, which is another site plan review. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. It's being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard. This public hearing is continued from June 5th, 2024. This is site plan review 2024-08. Applicant is CIL Realty of Massachusetts, Inc. Address is 51 Hunters Hill Circle. Request site plan review approval under section 3.36 of the zoning bylaw, philanthropic or charitable medical or residential facility for a change of use and site alterations, including two ADA ramps, rear deck, impervious walkway, approximately 150 feet of vinyl privacy fence and repaved driveway. Parcel 16D-209 in the RN zoning district. All right, do we have any board member disclosures for this project? I do not see any. All right. Um, looks like Melissa, is it McGowan or? Okay, I, I got that right. Um, you guessed right. <laughs> all right, good. Uh, that's an unusual spelling. Um, so welcome back. And um, I guess you were not at the last meeting. You were the one who was absent and knew the answers to some of our questions. My apologies, I was on vacation. <laughs> That's good. That's a good thing. Okay, so do you want to introduce the or reintroduce the project and go through any sort of uh, narrative, uh, maybe touching on some of the things we asked about? Sure, I'd love to. So we are proposing to um, renovate the existing single family home at 51 Hunters Hill. Um, from a three bedroom house to a three bedroom house, we're essentially just adding in an accessible bathroom and an additional bedroom um, and tr moving one bedroom as an office. Anyway, um, I believe the issues that came up at the last meeting as the site plan, we're proposing to put in a about 150 feet of privacy fencing, um, repave the existing driveway with the existing footprint, install a generator, um, and install ADA accessible egress uh, front and back, which means um, accessible doors with thresholds to accessible landings to a ramp to a hard surface, which exits out to the front of the house. Um, and included in that are downcast lights. So that's, that's pretty much the extent of um, the site plan. Um, I know that I think there were some questions that came up, which I responded to. Um, I don't know if those were circulated to you guys. Um, kind of just answering some technical questions about the generator. It's just a full full house Generac generator, pretty standard. Um, 
we showed the location on the plan. Um, we don't have it in our budget um, to put a turnaround um, at the end of the driveway. And I also, um, Jennifer and Tara are here, they're as attendees and they are from the agency that is going to be um, occupying the home and they can speak to specific questions about the program, um, the staff and the residents. Um, I'm, I'm not able to answer that with any, uh, well, I shouldn't say accuracy, but they're better suited to speak to that, so. Okay. Well, I think I think have, that's where we're at. So yeah, we do have a letter from you for June eighteenth, where you responded to many of our to most of our questions. So, um, board members, are there further questions or further conversation about some of the issues that we asked about last time, or have the responses we've received in here in writing are those adequate to the to the conversation and we can talk about whether we uh, would approve this site plan. Sorry. Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> Johanna. I will confess I have not had a chance to read the letter. The two things that I remember, so you can say, don't waste our time, Johanna. But the two things that I remember really rising to the surface when we were discussing this was um, how many cars were likely to be at the residence on any given day, and does the current does the planned driveway um, arrangement allow for kind of safe entry, turning, etc. Um, so that was the first question. And then the second question came from one of the abutters um, who just really appreciates the natural feel of the backyard and the and is like grateful that the vegetation is still going to be there, but was hoping that the fence itself wouldn't just be like a big white vinyl construction that would kind of take away the soft natural feel of that kind of shared back yard area so again feel free to direct me to the letter and i'll go track it down real quick um but if those two points could be addressed now i'd appreciate can it can i do you want me to speak to those now yeah or should I, can, okay okay can, Melissa, um yeah, so the you. first question about the fence the fence is probably it's within the setback so i think the setback is 15 feet um, on that rear property line. And so it's not our intent to clear out the vegetation at all. It's just to put the fence, you know, 15 feet off the property line and maintain um, as much, you know, I, we're not gonna clear it out and mulch it, but we're also not gonna let it get completely overgrown either. I think it's just kind of, it is what it is as it is right now, plus a white vinyl privacy fence, which is sort of just a standard construction. It's, um, you know, it's not gonna be, ugly. It's, it's like I said, pretty standard. Um, and as far as parking, we can't speak, I can't speak to specifics of numbers of cars because as anybody would have at their house, you know, cars come and go. Um, but staff may or may not have cars. There may be two or three cars in the driveway at any one time. Um, and street parking is permitted. So, you know, that's always kind of the backup. We obviously want to be good neighbors and we want to, you know, keep people on the driveway and, and um, kind of maintain the feel as, as things are. But there's, there's adequate parking now for at least three vehicles. Um, it's a very long driveway. So, I mean, theoretically you could Pez dispenser a lot of cars in there, but that it wouldn't be that way, so. And you also say that the residents won't have cars. They will not, no. So it's, so really, it's just, really just it's staff. Just staff. Correct. Yeah. And thank you. I just pulled up the letter and I appreciate your responses there. I guess I'm going to push you a little bit more about the fence. Um, does it need to be a white solid vinyl fence or could it be a black chain link fence? Um, it's a privacy fence. So, so you want a screen view correct. Into, the, into the yard. Correct. And it's, and it's for, you know, I mean, it's anybody that would put a privacy fence up that is, you know, 
kind of maintaining the privacy of their property. That's okay. That that's all it is simply. Right. Just the Bruce. Um, I just want to push a little bit uh, uh, to us as a as a board. Um, it seems that we would, uh, Melissa. I understand it's the staff uh, parking only, and they're coming, and, and and you're going to expect that they can organise themselves at the head of the drive, and they can back down and shuffle and all of that sort of thing. Um, and and you note that Rob Morris. Uh, comfortable with that from his point of view as a building commissioner, I guess. Um, it still seems a bit uh, odd to me that we wouldn't ask for a turnaround to be installed uh, for the sort of use that you're proposing, uh, coming and going, a place to, you know, put snow and so forth like that, perhaps. Or to... But uh, you say that the, your budget is uh, tight and that if we were obligating you to do that, it would probably add, I don't know, five to or more thousand to the budget and I can I understand that that's a significant number I guess so um I'm on the fence about this it seems to me that we we should uh um, as a board ask for this ask for a turnaround to be put at the head of this driveway but but the applicant and the billing commissioner are, uh, are disinclined to think this is critical um what do you the what do the rest of us think? I'm I'm ACDC on this. It seems to me that it's a good idea to do it, but I don't want to breadcrust anybody's budget unnecessarily. Um, uh, but you know, it's one of those things, Melissa. You may thank us for year two, three, four. So I don't want to cave automatically because pr pr personally, I think we'd probably ultimately be doing you a favor. But there wouldn't be a favor in your first year, I'm sure. Sounds like. Uh, asking, so, I'm asking for us to consider this. I yeah, don't want to, you're asking to, to for not uh, opinion. How do people feel about uh, insisting on a turnaround in this project? Um, I guess I'm I'm not feeling as strongly about it as you are, Chris or uh, Bruce. Um, Johanna, you had your name, your hand up. I don't know. Yeah. Before, um, I don't before just, Bruce asked his question. It's true. Um, I had one thought about the fence and then, but I'm happy to talk for a second. I'm also not inclined to push that hard on the turnaround. Um, it, yeah, it's a three bedroom house. And if none of the occupants are going to have cars, it just doesn't seem like there's, I don't know, I, I we might be like in pursuit of a solution. So like, what is it when a solution is in search of a problem? I feel like it's a little bit that, um, and that feels unnecessary. On the fence, I wonder whether the applicant has considered a color other than white, because even that could potentially make a difference for some of the abutters who are trying to preserve the natural feel. I can say because of I had this very experience in Springfield um, that other colors are available, but at quite a premium. So, you know, wood is always an option, but it's not an option for us. It requires more maintenance. It's not, you know, a, a white vinyl fence um, is very clean. It, you power wash it every year or two. Um, that's just, that's what we like to see. Like I said, it's it's really it's really standard. It's really clean looking, um, you know. And it's like I said, a pri it's a privacy fence, so it's, it's, it's it it is it that it's serving its purpose. So Just we have considered it, but we don't have the money to put in anything super fancy. Okay, uh, Jesse. We still have Bruce's question on the floor too. I, I was going to concur with Johanna. I, I don't think I don't feel a need to push on the turnaround. I think it's fine without. Um, and for the fence, I think is also probably fine. Going with white. Okay. All right. Uh, looks like we've lost Karen. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and I was Chris. You'd said she may not even have wasn't even going to come. So okay, all right. Um, do we have any members of the public who want to comment on this project? All right, not seeing any hands raised. All right. We draft some standard um, conditions and also I think there was a very standard um, finding if you yeah. bring those up. Okay, they should be showing. These conditions are the same as the for the other project. The only thing is that we added um, a condition about air conditioning units, communication devices, <coughs> and other outside mechanical equipment to be screened from view and noise muffled with fencing, plantings, or other suitable materials. So. They have a generator here, and I didn't know if you wanted to um, impose this kind of a condition or not. <coughs> is this a gasoline generator? It is a propane generator. Propane. And it's okay. it's on the side of the house um, that's kind of the furthest away from the neighbors. It's on the right side of the house. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that makes any difference. It kind of comes like any Generac generator comes enclosed in its own kind of sound box, but they still make noise, obviously, <laughs> when they're I running. I assume you test it once a month or something? Weekly for five minutes. Weekly, OK. All right, Bruce? Um, and Melissa's provided the decibel rating for this generator, and uh, I could uh, uh, remind or inform the board that the, the noise level of this generator is approximately equal or less than uh, the noise generated by uh, heat pump water heaters that people often have in there, well, that have in their houses. So this thing is quieter than the device that people are comfortable or or, or at least accept uh, installing in their, inside their house. So I, I think we can be comfortable that uh, this doesn't need any special um, noise screening. Okay. I think I would agree with that. Mr. Um, Mr. Marshall, does that mean there's just no noise screening or should there be visual screening or should you just not screen this? Um, well, I think between Bruce and I, we were, we were advocating for no noise screening. I can say personally, I'm not sure there needs to be any uh, visual screening. It is in its own little box. Uh, do any board members disagree with that and would want to have some visual screening? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, there's Fred. You're muted, Mr. Hartwell. Sorry about that. Yeah, I don't feel strongly about this, but um, I would point out that uh, on a, uh, a site plan that we did a couple streets over from the street I live on, there was, a, I think it was an air conditioning unit. And uh, I thought it was excessive, but the, I got outvoted and the board insisted on screening. And uh, I think what's good for the goose is good for the gander here. I, I, um, why is this different? OK. Um, do other board members have an opinion about that? So I, I'm just going to jump in. I'm just going to um, share my screen um, because um, Here's the site plan that's yeah that's uh 
here's the generator. Uh, and then here's um, a Google, you know, satellite image. So the generator is here. And so, you know, given its location and all the vegetation that's already in front of it, I mean, I think here's um, here's a street view. So, you know, all this vegetation is in front of it already. I, I feel like it's pretty well screened. I, don't, I mean, unless this is being removed, but I don't know. No, you know, there's no indication that it is. Um, you know, I think the difference being, Fred, when it was proposed, the other project, it was highly visible uh, here. It's set back quite a distance from the road. I mean, it's like, you know, 150 feet or something. Okay, thanks, Nate, for that supplemental information. Um, Chris. So I'm hearing delete item eight, delete condition eight. That would well, be an emotion that I would make if I made um, it. Well, I don't know that we had talked about deleting your entire motion. It was really just whether we should include the generator in that equipment. Isn't that right? Does anybody disagree with what I thought we were talking about? <laughs> Pam, can you bring the um, condition up? Yeah, where'd it go? Well, uh, Nate knocked it off. There we go. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Here it is, number eight. Yep. So I think we've decided not to apply it to the generator. Do you want but, to keep it for other when, devices? Yeah, when, when you read it originally, I don't think anybody objected to in, including it. Fred, your hand is still up. Is that a legacy? Uh, no, I just wanted to to say that uh, uh, I think Nate made the relative, the, the appropriate rebuttal to my comment, and I'm perfectly comfortable uh, withdrawing that objection. Okay, and since 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 you you've got the floor, how do you feel about uh, this condition eight in general? Do you think we should keep it or just strike the whole thing? Um, I would consider striking it. Uh, I'd like to hear from st staff on this, whether there's, uh, and I don't know what else is out there for that, that number eight would apply to. Um, I, if this, having looked at, uh, the, uh, the view from the street that Nate provided, um <laughs> I question the relevance of eight in this case. Okay. Great. Bruce. And uh, I I'm not strongly in favor of keeping it, but I'm not strongly in favor of deleting it either, because I think basically uh that site uh I was uh I I, I did I was on the site visit and uh it seems to me that things are pretty much screened no matter what because of the vegetation and, uh, and so forth around it. It's very dense. So I don't think any, I don't think condition, I don't think a condition eight would uh, likely require any additional planting for the applicant. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it was, is a special uh, permit and, and putting this in would protect uh, uh, I mean, if the trees came down or something like that, it's still there, and so then it's a, it's a requirement. So I, I, I don't think there's a harm in keeping it in. Okay. This is a, a site plan review. It's not a special permit. Oh, I beg your pardon. But still, the, the, uh, the, the, the trees aren't permanent necessarily. Right. So. I, I agree. I think eventually they could come down. Uh, Jesse. Yeah, I was just going to say it seems to meet that condition as is, so I don't think there's any harm in leaving it for future. Okay. All right. 
All right, I'm, I think we're getting kind of a critical mass of folks who are saying, let's just leave it as is, Chris. And make a statement that it doesn't apply to the generator or just leave it? Well, yeah. sure. Yeah. Leave the generator out of it because other mechanical equipment is there. I don't think we have to particularly apply the generator. Right. So just the way the, way the normal... Um, Printing is done is what you want to keep, and you want to eliminate the bold italics. Correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. And then the last condition has to do with trash delivery and the maintenance and landscaping equipment and the hours in which that happens and days. So oh, that looks pretty standard too. All right, uh, and then the findings that we are in compliance or the project is in compliance with section 11.24. So again, this is pretty, pretty simple. Anybody wanna change any of these draft conditions or findings, any? All right. All right, so uh, maybe Bruce, are you going to do another motion tonight? I was, but if anyone else wants to do it, I'm. I don't. I just want to move things along. That's it. Yeah. Well, why don't you do it? Okay, move that uh, the board approve uh, 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 SPR twenty four four oh eight uh, uh, for the uh, project at uh, fifty one Hunters Hill with the. Uh, the nine uh, conditions as uh, uh, drafted and with the uh, finding uh, as drafted and to close the public hearing. All right, thank you, Jesse. I second that. Thank you. All right, any further comments from board members or the public? All right, we'll go ahead with this. Roll call vote. Uh, all right, Bruce, starting with you. Aye. Uh, Fred. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And we've lost Karen. So I'm an aye as well. That is five in favor, two absences. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. All right. Good Have luck. Have a good one. Thank you for your time. All right. Time is 7.56 on my clock. Just in time for our 8 o'clock break. We'll take five minutes and come back right after 8 o'clock. Uh, please mute and turn off your phone now and then Turn on your turn on your camera when you come back, at least so we know you're back.
Jesse. Hello. Hi. You guys on a break? Yes. <laughs> Good timing. <laughs> Well, I kind of figured, I figured that it would be, so what did you guys cover so far? Uh, both of the site plan, no, the special permit and then the site plan. How did the Portland Lou go? Um, fine. No, no real issues. Some discussion, but got approved with the 10 foot distance from the sidewalk. That was the I was reading, I, I was reading, they were like the design review board was debating the color, but I was hoping they would just paint over it. Like some kind of cool graffiti or something, or <laughs> paint like paint over. Paint over. Hello, Janet. I'm muted too. You you got muted, Janet. <clears throat> All right, looks like everybody except for Fred is back. There's Fred. All right. Great. And Janet, I see you've arrived, so welcome. Let's see, moving right along. Next, uh, item five. So the time now is 8.03 and we'll continue with our meeting. We're up to item five, the open space and recreation plan. So uh, I assume town staff would like to introduce this. Yeah, I just say a few words of introduction. We had thought that we were going to be submitting this plan by the end of June. Um, and it became clear that we really would do a better job if we um, spent a little more time on it. And also there were no crucial um, applications or grant applications that we needed to file that this um, OSRP would have helped us with. So we've decided to take a little bit easier time and we're going to be um, working on it over the summer. Nate has been putting in a tremendous amount of time on this along with um, Aaron Jock of the Conservation um, Department and um, others in the planning staff. And um, so Nate will present uh, sort of an outline of what we're doing and give you some um, a presentation on goals, objectives, and some action items. All right, thank you. Oh, and I just wanted to say, eventually we're gonna need a letter of support from you, so. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, everyone. Nate Malloy. Yeah, the town has an open space and recreation plan that was a, um, in 2017. It expired this year in April. Uh, the plans are a requirement to apply for certain funding, uh, state and federal funding. The uh, It's an open space and recreation plan. So the focus is, you know, open space, conservation, and then, you know, active recreation. Uh, the state prescribes the the plan. And so our current plan is pretty lengthy. You know, all the, I, I'll show the table of contents in a minute, but you know, essentially all the, the, the chapters, the maps, 
the subsections of the chapters, that's all required. So, you know, it's a pretty formulaic uh, document. It's similar to the housing production plan in that it has to meet a state standard to be approved. And then it's valid for a number of years, five to seven years, and it makes the town eligible to apply for funding. And so we're updating the plan. We've been working on it uh, for a number of months, actually, probably like eight months with staff turnover. It's been um, intermittent. We have done a community survey that had about 150 responses. We've done um, outreach, uh, you know, in person uh, at different recreation and conservation areas that's garnered a number of maybe responses, like 50 additional responses. Uh, and then there's, um, you know, there's been some other feedback. So we have about, you know, 200 um, public comments that help um, kind of frame the plan. Um, the, the, the plan structured, it has, you know, like the, the first few sections are just general information about the town of Amherst, you know, what our departments look like, uh, the amount of open space we have, the inventory of land. And then sections six through nine are the parts of the plan that get into the goals, objectives, and then action steps and kind of, you know, what really, what, what are you doing with the, you know, the background information? And so this is considered an update to the existing plan. Um, and so the, uh, the existing plan, you know, most of it will remain. And so uh, here's the table of contents. So, you know, an introduction, a community setting, that talks about you know the history of the town, you know population, employment, growth patterns, you know all that will just be updated. And really, the it's a pretty exhaustive uh, plan right now. I think actually the section three community settings really well done, but it's meant to be really what what is it? What's the importance of say the settlement patterns in terms of it, the open space and recreation? And you know what what's the importance of the employment in terms of you know same thing? And so, you know. I think in this version, we're trying to be a little bit more cognizant of, you know, the, and we mentioned in the plan, but you know, that we have a daytime population, we have, you know, a university and colleges. And so, you know, we plan for that in terms of even like our recreational facilities, how are, how is that impacted by the population that comes and goes? And, you know, I think in this plan and the previous plan, say from the early 2000s, we would just, we would list all the employment, we'd have a big description about it, but not really talk about why that's a factor in planning for open space and recreation. Um, you know, section four is kind of outlining all the an inventory of the different types of environments in Amherst, flood hazard areas. Uh, again, all this is required by the state. Um, section five is more about our inventory of lands. And so, you know, we've worked with the assessor and the town's GIS department to you know, create new maps, look at what we've conserved in the last seven years. Uh, and then really the idea is section six is community vision, seven is analysis of needs. And so we take the, you know, your input tonight, uh, you'll, this will come back to you as Chris mentioned. Um, and then, you know, you can read the current plan and then the goals, draft goals that were sent. We hope to have a draft plan uh, ready in the next two weeks. And then your know, goals and objectives and the seven year action plan. And so an action plan, you know, is supposed to show short term, long term steps, who's responsible, and I think maybe funding. Uh, and in this, the state asks, you know, when you apply for funding, where in the plan did we mention said we want to put a new playground at Groff Park? And it should be mentioned somewhere in the action plan. It should also be referenced somewhere else in the plan. And so if we can say that, you know, certain action items were referenced a few times in the plan, it strengthens our applications. And so we've, we've taken the approach in the past that our goals are broad, our objectives are broad, and our action steps are, might name many things at once. So it's not, you know, some communities might say, you know, their one goal is to get the community pool. Well, we have a few pools. And so you typically our goal, you know, an objective or an action step might say the pools, and it might say a few of them. And so we don't want to limit ourselves to possibilities. Um, you know, recreation is taking a more active role in this, uh, especially now we have a recreation department. And so in terms of the inventory and needs, you know, they also did a survey uh, this winter um, that had a number, a few hundred responses as well in terms of what their program needs could be. And so that helps with this plan. And so, you know, all told we've had hundreds of responses that helped inform the draft goals and objectives that we can talk about tonight. Um, and so we have six goals right now. They could change. Each goal has an objective. And then 
right now they're they have action items are listed underneath but essentially in the in the plan it would be a goal an objective and under each objective we'd have to have a number of action items specific to that objective so we can't you know it wouldn't be in the format that it is tonight um so you know if you have six goals you have five goals or five objectives for each goal and then you have five action items all of a sudden you're talking about 150 action items that are enumerated in the plan that all has to have you know pretty detailed explanation. Uh, so it does grow exponentially, you know, depending on how much you have. I'm not saying that to limit what we're doing, but most plans have anywhere from like three to six goals, you know, three to six objectives per goal, and then just, you know, a few action items. Um, and so, you know, the first goal we have right now is uh, strategic connections between open space, parks, and recreation areas as village centers and village centers. And so, you know, what we've learned in the surveys and everything is we have a lot of protected open space and parks, but really, you know, making connections there, whether it's off-road, in-road, bike routes, um, you know, what can we do there? You know, and there's other barriers too. It could be public transportation. And so, you know, this is one goal. Uh, there's a few objectives here and then action items. And so, you know, through the public information gathering, this was something that was really stressed. It's something the towns try to work on um, you know, I know Kestrel Trust and others have also done some things about getting, you know, trailheads and locations where they can be near um, population centers. And so, you know, here that's one big goal. If we want to go through the objectives, we can. I just want to hit the, the bigger kind of draft goals. And these don't, these haven't changed too much from the current plan. So I think the current plan is a good point of reference. Like I said, it'll be, you know, you, it's being used as the, as the, kind of the backbone for the update. Um, the second goal, and they're not in priority order, is uh, protect and increase biodiversity, watershed lands, and critical natural resources. So again, there was a lot of public feedback about, you know, watershed lands and areas that are, you know, say unique to Amherst in terms of natural resources. And so um, it could be, you know, building out, uh, acquiring strategic pieces around Lawrence Swamp in our watershed lands and neighboring towns. Um, and then, you know, also managing uh, conservation areas or open space for, for habitat as well. So, you know, that's a, um, you know, a, one of the bigger goals. And then, like I said, it, you know, objectives can be, you know, acquisition and management of watershed properties. And then typically under that, an, an action item in this plan would be, you know, could be like prioritizing unprotected parcels, uh, you know, mapping unique resources. And so we'd have action items specific to that objective. Uh, the third goal is, is a big one. Um, incorporate climate resiliency, sustainability, public awareness, equity, and inclusion in all recreation and open space programs. And so, you know, this is something that is uh, perhaps implicit in the current plan, but we'd like to call it out a little bit more. Uh, and, you know, and there's a number of things here. Some of it is just kind of the public outreach and education uh, to let people know what we have, where they can go, how they can use it. Uh, you know, we have a dog park now. Uh, you know, we have a bike share program. And, you know, uh, in some of the point in place surveys that staff had done, people weren't aware of even some of the things we have. And so, you know, how do we, how do we highlight those? And then how do we get more people using uh, what we have? And so, uh, you know, for instance, Puffer's Pond could be used as a cooling center. It could be, you know, make sure that there's uh, public transportation serves it year round. And so, uh, you know, things like that. And, and um, you know, like I said, we try to write the goals so they are broad. Uh, there's the last one is specific, but I think, you know, these are, you know, meant to then be uh, kind of refined with the objectives and action items. The last two, the last goal, goals four and five mirror each other. One is maintain, enhance, and expand parks and recreation areas. Um, I think the focus here is really on, you know, maintain and enhance. And so, uh, you know, make things more accessible, improve facilities, uh, you know, maybe add small, like you said, neighborhood parks here as an objective. But really, uh, the focus isn't on necessarily, you know, creating and buying more land for parks, but managing what, what the town has. And then for open space and conservation, it's the same thing, maintain, enhance, and expand open space and conservation areas. And so, 
you know, the town's becoming more strategic about its acquisition of open space. Uh, you know, we had for, I think, 42 or 45 years applied for a land grant every year to acquire land, whether in fee or conservation restriction. And that stopped a few years ago. And we've been, um, you know, we don't apply every year now. Uh, if, you know, um, if, for instance, you know, we think that maybe the a project could could wait or we could try to have a combination of uh, land conservation and housing. And so, you know, we're having kind of broader discussions and it being a bit more strategic about, you know, land. You know, we're still the town is still acquiring land. But, you know, um, you know, if someone offers five acres and it's not connected to anything, it's you know not near a wildlife corridor, it's already surrounded by development. Is that really a key you know property to acquire or are we looking at you know land adjacent to you know existing conservation areas or that are near you know the streams and rivers in town and so you know i think that uh, for this goal we have a few objectives and some action items it could be expanded now goal six is something staff hasn't necessarily talked about but it's something that was mentioned a lot in the survey responses is um, addressing off-leash dogs and you know all over town you know you know so this was put in here my opinion this this could be an objective under a goal but you know maybe there was enough of a, you know enough public opinion on this that it should be its own goal that's pretty specific and uh you know so so here it is um you know and there's a few objectives and action items under that uh you know i think that you know we looked at deerfield has updated their plan recently ipswich uh, i mean gloucester has one uh you know there's a few other communities we looked at examples you know gloucester had some similar goals you know and one of theirs may have been specific about you know like uh increasing um access and you know maintenance of beaches and public beaches because you know that's important for their community and so uh you know maybe this dog off-leash dogs is is important for amherst um, generally, these goals are, like I said, you know, kind of appropriate for the plan. The idea is the objectives could be um, refined and then action items uh, added to. So in the existing plan, we have, let's see if I can jump, if this will still work, you know. That's supposed to be an active, uh, sorry, an active link to jump down to that. So I'm just going to do a quick scroll. Um, we have a, an action plan map, but this is what the action plan looks like. So it's a multi-page chart with, you know, the goal up top, an objective, and action items with responsible entities, funding, and completion timeline. And so, you know, what was shown to you is really, you know, a draft that will have to then be not necessarily put in this format, but have all these. Um, categories you know who's responsible for completing it possible funding and a timeline you know so if the plan is a five to seven year plan is it you know one to two years two to four or longer and so um you know what we've done here in the current plan is you know we have a lot of action items and you know some of that like i said is we want to be able to prepare for possible funding opportunities and so we don't want to be so specific in this plan that we don't mention something that could be a priority in two years or three years, uh, you know. And so we're looking to the Conservation Commission is actually actually discussing this too tonight. Recreation Commission is, has talked about it. They're going to do that again, uh, and also seek public comment at their meetings, and you know, really hope to have you know some more objectives under each of those categories on the plan in terms of what recreation sees as needs and as trends and goals for you know moving forward objectives so you know for a long time we had a skate park uh, in the plan i'm not sure a skate park is you know maybe it's still a, a big one um uh maybe not you know we have outdoor pools do we really need another one or maybe it's about you know maintaining them and expanding programming uh you know uh getting public transportation to pools in the summer and so you know i think the overall goals are pretty similar to some of the ones we have in the existing plan and we've used for the last few plans, but some of it is that the action items and objectives will change as, you know, needs and trends change. Uh, you know, we're an aging population. So some of it also is about, you know, accessibility, different circuits or programs that could happen or 
um, you know, um, exercises that could you could have at different parks or areas. And so, you know, all those things are will be action items in the plan that try to anticipate what we think, you know, could be done. And it's not, you know, I, I don't want to say it's a wish list, but you know, we've probably implemented a number of things in the plan. But you know, like I said, if you saw that there is, you know, hundreds of action items. And so, you know, staff does use it to help apply for grants or prioritize, you know, capital needs and conservation and recreation. Uh, but you know, it, it is a lot in there. So Nate, um, what do you want from us tonight? Do you, are you just doing this overview and then it, we, at some point in the future, we'll see a more detailed plan. Do you want some comments on what you've shown us or? Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, in the next two weeks, we'd like to have a draft plan that would be made public and you could, the staff could read that and, uh, or share that with you. I think for tonight or after tonight could just be, you know, looking at the goals and objectives, you know, are there, uh, you know, and you can send comments to staff individually, but, you know, are there any gaps or is there something that's like, okay, wow, you know, what your understanding or what you, what you hear or what, you know, what you, your impression is, um, you know, you know, like, although we've had, you know, a few hundred responses here and, you know, recreation's had some, you know, there's, you know, we did have, you know, for instance, it may have been, you know, a, a lot of respondents were the same kind of demographics. And so, you know, are, did we miss some or do we not hear from certain demographics or anyway, so the, some of it would be, you know, as planning board members, you know, what, what are you hearing in the community? What do you see? And as Chris mentioned, uh, the state has listed the planning board, uh, the regional planning agency, and uh, the town manager as three entities that have to, I don't wanna say, I don't know if it's like approve the plan or support it and then write a letter when we submit it to the state saying that, you know, you've, you know, you support it, it's general goals. Uh, well, we also have the conservation commission and recreation commission do the same. And so, um, but the requirements are the regional planning agency, planning board and town CEO. Okay. so. Ultim I mean, you'll probably get a couple comments now, but um, right. we could send our comments to you or and Chris just over the next couple of weeks. Yep. Yeah. And when we have, like I said, that draft plan, we'll send it out too. Okay. Johanna. Great. Thanks. Nate, really appreciate looking at this. Um, my question is, when I think about goals, goals are like, getting a particular thing done on a specific timetable. And when I read this, there is, there's a lot in here and there are parts of it that almost feel more like a vision than goals. And so I guess my question is, are there actual, like, is this, is the idea, these are the goals for the next five year period or the next 10 year period, or is it more like, wow, this would be great if we could do all this. Do you understand my question? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a seven-year plan. And so really the goals would be, you know, seven years. I don't, you know, I, I think, um, and yeah, I think some of it would be, like I said, we want to keep them a little broad just because, you know, the state wants this format where we have goals, objectives, and action items. And so if a goal is so specific that then you can't have objectives or action items underneath it, then it won't follow that format. So, you know, currently we have six goals in the plan, you know, and the first one is increase recreational active and passive opportunities near village centers and other appropriate areas to serve a variety of users and needs. Um, the second goal is improve stewardship and management of conservation lands, trails, and recreation areas. And so, you know, what we've, what, you know, we've kind of reworked them. Uh, we really actually, staff tried not to look at the existing goals at all and objectives and writing the draft that you saw just to say, okay, well, based on all the feedback, what what would we say are kind of new goals? Um, but then, you know, we're, we're probably gonna go back and kind of ground truth it a little bit with what we already have in our plan. All right, Chris. So Nate had mentioned to me that he thought it would be a good idea if you all read the existing plan. And I want to know if he still thinks that's true. And if so, where where can the planning board find the existing plan? Well, it was in the packet, but I think, you know, for now, if anything, you know, sections six through nine are really the part that the state 
uh, once updated in that section six is kind of the community vision and outreach process. And then it's community needs, the goals and objectives and the action plan. And so if you were to focus on anything, it's six through nine. And, you know, you could read what we have. I'd read it kind of lightly. Um, and then, you know, anticipate a, a newer draft coming out. So then you can see what what's changed. But, um, you know, the I think the existing plan has a really great, you know, community setting section uh, and, you know, great information about demographics. And we're updating that. I don't, you know, you can read it, but I don't, like I said, to me, the point of all those sections are really, you know, the settlement pattern of Amherst has influenced where open space is and say where we have certain parks and recreation. Um, I think sometimes we, in our current plan, we actually have more information that isn't germane to the open space and rec plan, right? Like we list the top 10 employers down to the number of employees, you know, like 52 and a half FTEs. Like, well, to me, it's like, what is the point of that if it's not related to kind of open space and rec planning? So in the new plan, we're not going to have a table that, you know, lists those, you know, in that detail. Um, you know, we still list employers, but by industry category using a state <clears throat> website, not, you know, anyways. So I, I would focus on six through nine if you're going to do anything. Okay. Um, Pam, I see your hand. You are muted. Nay, I don't believe that was in the packet. I, oh, I don't the believe... current plan wasn't? No. 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 Oh, oh, sorry. I, I downloaded I, I downloaded and had it in all my PDFs open for tonight. I guess I must have just downloaded it from the website. If if you went to um the conservation department. On the left hand side of the screen in the red banner, there's it, it, it says open space and rec plan, and then it has its own web page. I think if you just keyword search the town's web page, you could write, you know, 2000. Can we just send them a link? Yeah, we can send the link. All right. Um, Bruce. I thought Jesse was ahead of me. Oh, he's not got his hand down. Yeah, his hand. Um, uh so i um i mean if i uh, i uh, this is a process question Nate. i think uh, if i were thinking about this on uh, a seven to year you know uh, rotation i guess i would start by asking um how of what's what what is the trajectory of change in the town over the past seven years and anticipated through the next and you know, it, uh, you, well, the student population is getting a little bigger. Perhaps uh, the population is getting older, so that dog leash thing makes sense to me because there's more older people in uh, who are threat. Who, who um, I mean, I feel that, and I have a lot of my friends. So I understand why that's there, and I can understand that that's a change that's happening. And so I suppose. Uh, would it is it true to imagine that that's where you start with these things on a seven to seven year basis and you look and i uh, uh, i identify the way in which or things that are changing in town um uh, how the town is evolving from one thing to another i know for example when we did the the comp plan years ago we over a 200 year per, per period we noted that the town used to be a agriculturally focused town and then uh, 120 years ago, it was an industrial uh, focused town. And in uh, the last 50 or more years, it's been an education focused town. So this town has changed dramatically over 200 plus years. And so if you collapse that down into a, a, a seven year by seven year slice, I guess I would want to know that this plan was that, that the evolution of these plans would be starting with that kind of analysis of how is the town changing? What are the significant differences between the town now and seven years ago and seven years hence? Is that is 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 that uh, methodology fundamental to the way which you're thinking or the town is, or the the, the the drafters are thinking about this plan? Yeah, like I think, you know, the goal, say, for open space is, you know, not so much acquisition. So a previous plan was more about acquire land. Uh, you know, that was really uh, stressed. And so, you know, the, the current plan and then the new plan is more about stewardship and maintenance of existing land, you know, less about, say, just acquire, acquire, acquire. And so, you know, some of that, you know, is is there, you know, I think with the recent drought and, you know, what's happening with the weather and kind of the disruption to you know, weather patterns, you know, there's a, you know, a lot of 
comments about you know water supply protection and um, you know making sure that that's you know that that's adequately um, you know preserved and so you know that's something that's coming out I think yeah so I, I think to me that the goals may may um, outline that you know I think goal four or five whatever it was or three in terms of climate resiliency and um, inclusion is important I think more some of the objectives will get at that right so to me it's kind of like our housing production plan we're updating that right now too we we need housing like we needed housing in 2013 like we needed it in 1990 so you know but really it's maybe now more about right like what types of housing maybe it's you know housing that people can age in place in or maybe it is more senior housing and so when we looked at the goals for the open space and rec plan it, some of it is that and we're hoping that the rec recreation department um for the needs and trends we base it on we have to use the statewide um, open space and rec plan and the National Park Service standards. And so uh, we, we look at what they say are needs and trends and then what we hear locally. And so that influences where we are in terms of our, our objectives and our action items. Okay. okay. Uh, Janet? Um, does Chris want to go first? I don't know. Chris, you have your hand up? I just wondered if um, what Br Bruce was suggesting was some sort of narrative about how the town has changed over the last seven years and kind of a general, um, you know, broad sweeping narrative mm -hmm. about that. And and maybe that would be a good idea to see if we could incorporate that into one of the um, earlier chapters. And, um, you know, we could just sort of talk about it in house and and come up with some some broad sweeping statements about that. I think that's not a bad idea. Yeah, we, we do it in parts. So we, um, in growth and development patterns and then in community setting in the beginning, we have, um, we talk about what, you know, what's happened in the last seven years and kind of where we are. But I think, I think we could re-examine that just to make sure it covers everything, you know, to Bruce's points. It's, it's, I was thinking more as a statement of methodology, but also uh, as a kind of a preamble. And it would, it, it could be an introductory uh, preamble to every plan, which says, here's, here's what's different. Uh, here's how we think. You know, thought was, and you, you identified a few uh, things. And so it, it seems real that, uh, you know, the, the climate is forcing things a little differently. Age is forcing things. The university population is growing. We've got a new school that's just about to come online. I mean, you could probably add a few things that would explain why the drivers for how this plan is changed from the last plan. And I think it, that would be a good preamble that would help uh, agencies and so forth that are looking at the new plan. And they would understand that you weren't just uh, rubber stamp, you weren't just cranking out something that was the same as last time with a few. So I wouldn't bury it in, in uh, item by item, burying it in the plan. I would put it all out and put it at the front. So people are impressed by what you're doing. Yeah, section section one, I mean, the very first beginning do, does that. It, um, you know, it'll, it'll get there. Okay, uh, Janet. So I, I you know, thinking, of, I'm thinking about this, I think that um, the town has done a lot of great work on improving recreation. Like we have that dog park, um, the Kendrick Park playground is beautiful. Um, Graf Park got renovated and the spray park, which is in heavy use, um, you know, from what I can see. And then Hickory Ridge, we're building new trails um, that are accessible. And then the Fort River Fields are taking getting a huge upgrade. And so I think, you know, I don't know if you're going to mention that, but it seems like to me, a lot of the things that were in the plan and some things that weren't in the plan, you know, have really, there's been a lot of progress and improvements. Um so I, I just think we should take a second and recognize that. Um, I had some just very specific things. I haven't I haven't read the open space plan for like seven years or something, but um, one of them is, I, th I think objective three was like increasing the budget for maintenance. And I think that's a huge need. And I think, you know, I talked to the DPW guys and, you know, there's just not enough people maintaining trails or the parks or different, you know, other public spaces. And I know that um, the conservation department is doing trail maintenance and, you know, and in my area, we can expect one mow of a trail a year, which isn't enough. And so um, I also know people in my neighborhood 
you know, are really interested in doing kind of um, plans for conservation land or recreation land, and they would help plan the plans and maybe implement, you know, be a citizen group of, of um, maintaining stuff. And I don't know if that's, so I, I think maintenance has to be really highlighted as a huge need and a focus in the town. And that means money. And I, you know, it's, it's just, it has to be money. So I wouldn't really have deleted it as objective three or a goal. You know, I would think that's a big goal. Um, I think a, a very achievable thing we could do is to create maps of trails and the parks. Cause I, someone showed me one about all the different trails in Amherst. And I think it, we used to distribute that. And I know that, you know, we built like the, um, is it the sweet Alice trail? We did that, you know, whole trailhead entry. Um, I think we could really increase the use of the trails and bring people more and more people to town. And I'm always saying you can just walk around Amherst like eight hours, you know, it, it, there's, we have miles and miles of trails. And so I think that would be a great way of making the trail system more known and accessible with a, a good map and, um, and also the parks, cause they all sort of link up. Um, I wondered about the bicycle lanes like there was no discussion of on-road bicycle lanes. And so there was, I think there was talking about bicycle access like on trails, but I, I think that we have to sort of tie this into the need for, you know, protected bicycle lanes so people can get from East Hadley Road to Groff Park. You know, we've done that, right? But that has to happen all over the town of how can people get from village centers or from their apartment or their things to a recreational area. And so I would not just limit it, I would say on-road bicycle lanes. Um, and then another one idea I had, I mean, I just have to say, we have to put our dogs on leashes because my dog has been attacked several times in the last weeks by off-leash dogs. So I think that's super important. Um, and then what was the other one? I, I didn't really understand why we were trying to like increase um, the watershed areas and not the biodiverse areas. Like it seems to me that areas of high biodiversity need more of a buffer and more protection. And then I began to wonder is, are they just overlapping? Um, so that was kind of a question. I think that's my hit list. Um, I think that's it. But I, just, I wondered if biodiverse areas just overlap with watershed areas. I mean, yes and no, I think they do, but, you know, there's also areas that can be, you know, outside watershed lands that, you know, are also like biomap and critical natural resources. And so, um, you know, but they can, they can overlap. And so, you know, right now the town did just acquire, uh, you know, it was just, it was, um, it was like 11 acres or something, you know, um, in Shootsbury. So, you know, it's not, you know, most of our watershed land is pretty protected, pretty well protected, but the, our watershed lands in say Pelham and Shootsbury, uh, you know, up, up there, there's no public water or sewer. And so depending on what well and septic happens, you know, we really have to make sure the watershed lands are protected. It's not at the expense or, you know, precluding any, you know, acquisition of lands that are, you know, um, have a lot of biodiversity or, you know, map, the state has a number of mapping tools. So some of it is just, you know, looking at all of that and coming up with a plan. I will say that, you know, this is one plan in town, the historic preservation plan was just updated by the commission. We have a bike ped plan that PVPC had done a few years ago. You know, we have, um, you know, a transportation plan that's now, uh, you know, almost 10 years old, or maybe it is 10 years old, actually. Uh, and so there is probably redundancy in a lot of these plans. The idea is that this would be incorporated into the master plan. Uh, and then the master plan is going to get updated in the next, you know, five to six years, we'll say. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, say in terms of like, you know, in-road or, you know, um, bike, bike connections. Yeah, I, I think we'd have to make sure we're not, you know, saying only off-road, right? It's also any kind of bike, you know, bike transportation. I think the mapping thing is really interesting. I've, we've I've talked about this with IT that we have so much information online with GIS, but sometimes it's nice to have almost like a simple map, like a PDF map. It's not interactive of just you know, say, right, trail schools and recreation areas and, and trailheads is really important. So we've done some work on the parking areas. Yeah. And so when we did the bike share program where we, we really like the maps at, that, that's at those stations, uh, kind of the format. And so we've talked about, could we kind of adapt that to have, you know, even if it's like one or two maps, but have those available in a lot of places and online. And so people can see them and use them, you know, and they become, you know, put on kiosks. And it's just, you know, you can see it and understand it because 
yeah I, yeah I, it's sad when people say oh i didn't realize you know right we have over 80 miles of trails and they're not even sure how to get to to one yeah um, so i would i would i guess my specific recommendation is to one b add the bio map areas and core habitat for expansion or protection so those might be acquisition areas um because of their ecological importance so i wouldn't I wouldn't just limit it to the wetland, not the wetlands, the um, water resources. So I know they're often overlapping, but if there's not, that should be a real focus for acquisition or protection. So, but I think those maps would be just, people would just love them, you know, they would just love them. All right. And I guess we can send you other comments in the last, in the next couple of weeks when, and we'll wait to see the new, draft of the plan. Yeah, and you know, if you write, if you know, in the next two weeks, if you read the current plan or the draft goals that we're sending, you have ideas, you can send them along. Okay, Bruce? Just a question, Nate. Uh, is it appropriate, I mean, I read through this, uh, these action items and so forth, and of course, uh, I guess I hadn't studied the plan very carefully before, and I thought of two or three action items that I thought uh, could be on there, but I certainly didn't think it was appropriate to stop Telling publicly saying all of my own action items that uh, the things like might be good in North Amherst and so forth, but uh, would it be appropriate or inappropriate? Would it be? Is it okay for me, for example, to send uh, you some suggestions of things that look like they might be important or could be important for your consideration? In other words, it's virtually a public comment on the plan. It's not really something related specifically to us as a board. But oh, since yeah, yeah. I'm looking I, at it, can I do that, or is that? Yeah. Not fair. No, I think that's fair. So, you know, for instance, you know, a lot of the public comments may have focused on a few things. And when staff has met, we've said, you know, they, the public may not know what, what else there is. Right. And so, you know, like if, if no one's mentioning green infrastructure downtown, right, how can we try to manage stormwater on site more in urban areas? And, mm. you know, it's difficult to do, but maybe that becomes something we put in the plan. Uh, we've been talking about, say, certain things like that. And even if it's not mentioned a lot in the surveys or in the public feedback we're getting, it's something important that, you know, as part of new stormwater regulations that are coming out, it's something that you know, staff's been, you know, going to trainings on, okay, how do we put that in the plan? And so, you know, what we, what we have here in the draft is, like I said, trying to distill information from the surveys and what staff has said, but we're, you know, open to getting more, you know, ideas for objectives or action items. So, yeah. Well, for example, North Amherst Community Farm uh, Incorporated and Zave Zobak have been talking about uh, creating a, a trail through the middle of uh, North Amherst from the conservation area at Pine Street all the way up to uh, Eastman Lane. And it has to do with uh, getting permissions or there's a certain process for uh, liability eliminations for private property owners who's, who would, you know, through, through, through whom this would transact. So it's a, a rather nice idea, but I don't, I don't see it as an action item specifically. And I, I think maybe that would be a good one. There's a couple other things like that that I've been involved in that uh, appear not to be there, but maybe they are. But that's what I would be sending you. That's fine. Yeah, I, you know, what you're talking about, I think, is in the current plan. I know for a while I had actually, like, ten years ago, um, I, you know, I had we had looked at that because I think, um, you know, uh, cyclists also wanted an off-road connection, so we talked about going, you know, through right Eastman all the way up to Pine Street, uh, you know, between, you know between the two, you know, East Pleasant and North Pleasant. But I, I yeah, I, that's fine. If ever, if mm -hmm. other members have comments like that, that's fine. Um, and, it, and it can become an action item, right? Maybe maybe it, it becomes less specific about that area or maybe it is, and, but then we realize we can extrapolate it and say, okay, we need more off-road connections between, you know, in North Amherst as well as South Amherst here. And so, it, you know, maybe we, we add to it as part of a, an action item. I think that's... That's acceptable. Well, some of these are quite specific. I mean, building a bridge across the Hickory, uh, you know, building right. across a bridge across a creek. Uh, you know, so they have a particular creek in a particular place. So it was very specific. So I thought, well, goodness. Yeah, no, they are. I think, is the name of the game here. Yeah. Some are. Sometimes I'd like to say that one for Hickory is also like, again, could we, what we've done typically in the past when we get the, to the final plan, we'll say, you know, improve, you know, bridge, you know, bridges. And then we might, say Hickory and, you know, like Mill River, or Cushman or whatever, and just throw a few extras in there. Because if we apply for funding and we literally do not have that 
mentioned the state, you know, we'll miss out on a point or two on an application. So, you know, we, like I said, we might add a few more things to each of those action items to make sure it's has enough. But. Okay. All right. I don't see any more hands. Uh, thanks, Nate. And we'll look for the next draft. All right. Uh, the next topic on our agenda. Time is 8.45. Topic number five, six is University Drive Potential Housing Overlay Zone. Continue discussion. All right. Uh, Nate, maybe you're the one to introduce the materials that were in our packet. Sure, yeah. We, uh, uh, I will say that the housing uh, subcommittee, the planning board met, I guess it was just this week, it seems like it was longer ago, uh, and talked about it. And so, you know, Jesse could summarize that discussion a bit. Uh, in the packet, there's two versions. So after the last meeting uh, of the planning board staff, staff discussed, you know, what, you know, what, what's the, an option to take. And, you know, I think there is, you know, so what we have is two, one is a mixed use focus, we'll say, and one is housing focused. I, I'd say, you know, 90% of the bylaw is the same in both uh, the, the, you know, there's a few key differences. So in the mixed use one, the only thing that's allowed in the overlay is a mixed use building. Uh, you know, it, and then, you know, there's no distance from the corner or anything. And then we've defined mixed use differently in that it's 75% of the street facing facade to a, to a depth of 24 feet. Uh, so essentially it's saying that, you know, every building uh, has to have a mixed use component for most of its, you know, ground floor or, you know, street facing facade. Um, we did put an extra six story in there and only added a few feet to height. So, you know, we're, we've, in all of our versions, we have a pretty generous floor to floor to ceiling ratio. So even 65 feet for six floors, you know, is, is, you know, the building commissioner and staff feel like that's, you know, adequate to have six floors. Uh, there is no waiver for that. Uh, you know, in the current bylaw, the way we define height, um, you know, mechanical equipment, you know, is not included or a parapet wall isn't. So, uh, you know, there could be things higher than that. We do have provisions for things to be stepped back from the uh, buildings to, you know, to be screened or not visible. So, you know, I think that's a change in both is this extra story, uh, something to discuss, uh, this mixed use component, and then, um, which is different than 30% growth flare area. And so in the mixed use one, you know, we said if the idea really is to have a vibrant streetscape, let's just say it, right? We want everything up along the street. Uh, and it may actually end up being more than 30%. It could be less, but really what we're trying to do is get all the, you know, all the, most of the street facing um, ground floor to be activated. Uh, and then we, you know, rework kind of the open space piece with that pedestrian path on the west side uh, to really call that out in both versions. The other version is, you know, I'll say it's a housing, um, you know, can prioritize housing in that it still allows apartments and social dormitories, you know, beyond 500 feet uh, of the intersections of Amity, you know, with, um, and uh, Route 9 and Northampton Road. So, uh, you know, that's something that had been in there. We eliminated the, you know, at one point we said, oh, maybe there'd be a lower mixed use percentage if it was beyond 500 feet. But, you know, basically we're saying that within, you know, 500 feet of the intersection, you still are required to do mixed use, but on the interior, so for about a thousand feet along University Drive, uh, you know, you could do apartments or social dormitories. Again, adding a sixth floor. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, you know, staffs, you know, we're not, I think there's uh, benefits to both. I think, you know, at the discussion last time with the planning board and the housing subcommittee, you know, some of it is, um, you know, let's try to get what we would want. And then I think also, you know, I, th I think this actually would be a good test, right? So we have a council form of government and we say we can act quicker on zoning amendments or changes. But for instance, if we did adopt something or move this forward and it was adopted and, you know, after a year, it's not used, we could figure out why. Or if we have a project that we don't like, then I would say, well, let's change the, the overlay, right? And so that's something that has been said. And I'd like to say that we, we could actually follow through with that. And so... Um, you know, with that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm saying, well, 
you know, I, my preference would be for the, if the planning board were to adopt something tonight or to vote to move, recommend something to council, I'd want it to just be one. You know, there was some discussion about would the planning board recommend two, but I, I would, I'd only, I would say recommend one version and maybe it's the mixed use version. And let's just say it's the mixed use version. Uh, you know, we could talk about, um, you know, the sixth floor or parking or whatever else. Uh, and then we, you know, we could talk about that. Uh, I will say at the housing subcommittee, under parking, I would add a few more bullets. You know, I'd, I'd require the submittal uh, for every project of a utilization study and a parking management plan. And so I think there had been a bullet in there in a previous version that was lost in the current one, it would be brought back. And that way the, the planning board, you know, these are all site plan review uses, would actually understand what is the parking. And so then the developer would still have to, you know, describe what, what their need is and what they would want. And so, you know, for instance, if they don't think they need parking for residential units, they would show it. And then maybe a condition would be that the lease agreements have to say there's no parking spaces available. And it's different than the current bylaw where the planning board has to agree with the developer's um, utilization. Otherwise they still have to provide parking, right? You could deny waivers. And so really what we're saying is there's no parking requirements here, but they still have to show something to get at you know what they're thinking is the right level of you know right number of parking spaces, and I think it's a balance. Uh, uh, Barry's project on 422 Amity is uh, applied for site plan review, and I think during that discussion, you know, the amount of mixed use and units and beds and everything, it all works together in terms of parking. And so, you know, the housing subcommittee talked about you know what is the right mix, and I think given the location of University Drive, and you know that there's no on-street parking, uh, you know, it's not as if it's in the downtown parking area, municipal parking district. I think each project will talk to its neighbors, but, you know, really parking has to be located close to the project or they could come up with some other ideas, but it's really then incumbent on the developer if they think they have a successful project to determine what is the right parking. And so we're not, you know, this approach may not be used elsewhere. I might argue that this could be used everywhere in town, uh, because really the benefit would be um, private parking, you know, shared parking. So we eliminate the shared parking provision and it's been in there because the, the, the best thing would be for private property owners to get into their own agreements to manage it. And they, you know, they have a management plan that is on record with the town, but, you know, we don't need to go in and negotiate and monitor parking. And so we've talked about that downtown where, you know, we'd facilitate private to private agreements, but we'd be the enforcement agent which becomes, you know, really cumbersome with, you know, many different parties. It actually would be more efficient if, you know, say, you know, one developer and one, you know, two private properties discuss how they can share parking between themselves, which actually has happened on University Drive now. Uh, and it seems to work pretty well. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we are. I could share my screen. I can share my screen eventually, but, you know, really it's these two versions. I think we could maybe, Doug, quickly just say if there's, if people are leaning to one version or the other, and we could just then focus on that. Uh, or if we want to just kind of open it up in terms of like, you know, what we think is beneficial. But I, I you know, the hope was to get to the planning board to a vote tonight on, you know, one, yeah. one version. Yeah. Chris, I see your hand. Yeah, I wanted to um, just explain what the meaning of that is. Um, if the what planning the board voted to recommend one of these, is it okay to talk? Yeah, the, the meaning of what? Um, the meaning of what Nate just said. If the planning board voted to recommend one of these two um, documents, um, what would happen is it would go to town council and we would make a presentation or you would make a presentation before town council and say that you think this is a really good idea and that you want it to be a, um, a zoning amendment, a proposed zoning amendment. And then if the town council thought it was a good idea, um, if a majority of them did, then they would... Um, take it upon themselves to refer it to the planning board and to the <laughs> CRC for public hearing. So that would start a process. So I just wanted to let you know that that's kind of what, what we're imagining for this. And that's, it, you know, it would get the ball rolling. And so that's similar to what sort of started with the solar bylaw. I guess that didn't originate with us. That originated with the working group. So that's, this is not the same as the solar bylaw proposal. No. Okay. 
Um, well, I'm yeah, I, I guess I was hoping we could vote on this sometime soon. We've been talking about it all spring. Um, I do have a few questions myself, so I'm hoping we can have some conversation. Jesse, why don't you go ahead? Sure. I was just going to add that I think the only thing the subcommittee was in complete agreement on was trying to move it forward, hopefully tonight. So did, did <laughs> um, the subcommittee see both of these, or yes. is this the first you've seen them? We we saw both, and we discussed, and we went back and forth a little. Um, there was one suggestion of putting both forward. There was more discussion. I don't think we really landed on all agreeing on just one. Um, maybe we can get there tonight. Okay, great. Uh, I think two of the main pieces of disagreement were around the parking requirement and um, any requirement for different types of housing within the units, which I think is not currently in either one. Okay. Um, Nate, um, I guess can, if I can ask you a, at least a cu couple of questions, um, the mixed use only proposal, you said earlier that you were redefining mixed use. Um, it doesn't look that way. It looks like you have two additional bullets that add to the what I guess is the standard definition of mixed use in the rest of the bylaw. It says with the following additional requirements, and I'm not seeing where mixed use is said to be redefined. Oh, well, we wouldn't use the 30%. It would only be that 75% of the facade. So you don't say anywhere that the 30% of the standard bylaw is not applicable. Right, right. I mean, I guess we could. The idea is that the, all right. Yeah, I mean, the building commissioners, you know, assume to understand that that's, you know, that's uh, previously we had said that the um, overlay will have its own, um, you know, definitions and standards. And so that's, you know, his, you know, the, I guess, you know, maybe we're just into it too much to see that, you know, uh, Yeah, I just clear. think it, with the following additional requirements suggests that it's in addition to whatever else there is out there and right. that that's misleading me. Okay. Um, and then the other proposal, the housing focused one does utilize the existing mixed use definition, including the 30%, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, those were that was my immediate questions. Janet, um, I'm actually confused. I thought that under the mixed use proposal, it would be thirty percent of the first floor, but requiring that this the seventy five percent of the street facing facade be on you know be you know whatever the the front is seventy five percent would be you know, commercial or retail space. So I didn't realize that we were deleting the 30% um, at all. So I'm not sure that, that the I'm not on the housing subcommittee, but I'm not sure if everybody understood that. I think we also did talk a lot about that sixth floor. Um, some people were against it and some people thought that if it is added, there'd be some kind of give back, like more inclusionary zoning or something or be step back. Um, so... Okay. Are there other comments? I, I think what I'm I'm wondering is whether we should at some point before the evening is over just have a straight up or down vote on both of these to see, you know, do these have legs? And um, maybe it's a not non-binding vote if if we still want to tweak it, but you know, can we focus where we're where we're thinking? <laughs> Uh, and uh, okay, so Jesse. Sure, I was also gonna add that we also discussed or recognize that this is the beginning of the process that Chris just laid out for us. And so that maybe we don't need to be too prescriptive right now because there will be a lot of public comment before it comes back to us again, really whatever we put forward. Okay. So that's That was the general sense also on the subcommittee, I think. All right. 
Bruce? Bruce, you are muted. Apologies. With that in mind, I, I was uh, going to propose uh, or move that we uh, favor the mixed use. Uh, and I won't even qualify it about whether it is inclusive rezoning or not. And it, it does have six floors, so it's uh, that. It, it has a, a, a parking uh, as... Uh, um, there's no prescript there's no prescriptive parking i think i would like the during the subcommittee nate you said that you would make clear the the bullets and so forth there's a couple more bullets so but num you can put that in if you choose but uh uh and uh i'm with janet i might think that having the 30 percent tfa because i think i asked you because you've got one of them with the with the 30 percent uh, uh, uh the ground floor area, which is an area uh, um, criterion. And then in the other, you've got a, a linear criterion, which is 70%, 75% of the, the, the frontage. Um, but for the moment, I, I'm going to just propose that we favor the mixed use and see where it ends up. So that's a, mo that's a motion. I don't understand. Yeah, I move. I move that the uh, the board uh, uh, recommend to town council that uh, this uh, change in the bylaw take place on the basis of the draft, the mixed use draft. Is is uh, that we send we send that draft as the basis of the recommendation to council. Okay, uh, Jesse, your hand went up next. Sure, I would second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Uh, discussion, Janet. So one of, one of the things we talked about at the housing um, subcommittee was um, I feel that the parking, Article 7, our parking regulation is very flexible. And so any developer can come in and say, I don't need two parking spaces per unit. Or, you know, I have a um, quick stop and people are just going to pull in and pull out of, you know, the dry cleaner. So I don't need, you know, X amount of spaces for my square footage. And so they can come in and make that showing. And the planning board can say, we agree. Um, or a developer could come and say, you know, I, I don't want to do any parking. I just, you know, there's, you know, nobody in my building is going to need a car. And the planning board can come back and say, well, that's really hard to understand. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, you, you know, it's, you know, you have 300 units, you know, or 200 units, or you have, you know, commercial and retail space, it doesn't seem plausible to us. Everyone's going to show up by a bus. And so Article 7 gives us the authority to say yes or no, or modify whatever the parking proposal is. If we have no parking requirement, I personally don't see anything in Article 11, site plan review, where we could say, okay, your parking management plan is a building full of leases that say you can't have parking. We just don't think this is going to work. You know, this is not a realistic plan. Maybe you get one parking space per unit that could be four bedrooms, or you can get a half parking space per unit that could be, you know, two, four bedrooms. Um, I, I don't see any legal ability that we can have and say, well, that's an interesting parking management plan put some parking in. And so we, you know, we, we were allowed to put conditions on, you know, projects, but we have to have some legal authority in the bylaw and article seven, the parking and access regulations bylaw gives us the ability to say yes, no, or maybe, or we're just going to change this a little bit. So I think if we lose any parking requirement, we have no ability to say, wow, that's a bad plan. That's a bad parking management plan. Um, and so I, I don't want to give that up. And it's not just for residential, it's like religious and educational uses, retail offices and similar uses, you know, it's, but it's a very flexible requirement. And at the end of article seven, we have an ability to just, again, modify just saying, give us a good management plan, maybe some special shuttle buses or something. So I think it's too, I think we have a very flexible parking requirement if we say there's none we have no ability to to impose 
or change anybody's plan. So I wouldn't do it. Okay. So you don't like the way it's drafted. Yes, that's but that's one of my criticisms. Yes. Okay. I will say that, you know, to um to that point, I think I had said it, but that we would add the bullets that an applicant is required to submit a parking utilization study and a parking management plan. And that would be used as the decision for the board. And so those are two bullets that after the housing subcommittee discussion, that those would be wrapped into those parking requirements. And so I think, as we said, I said, Jen, at the housing subcommittee, the difference is the board could say no and still require parking. And so there's really not that much flexibility. The flexibility is that here, the developer is actually, you know, figuring out what they can, what they need to make a project successful. And so, you know, if, if, if the board doesn't think that a waiver is grantable or it's not for aesthetics or site design or something, they could say no to any of those. And so I don't think having a very prescriptive parking requirement given this, the location of University Drive and what's around it is necessary. Like I said, it may be different other parts of town. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, what, but requiring that they provide a utilization study and a parking management plan as the basis for a decision of the planning board is asking them to do something and provide information. So it's not, you know, they're just coming in and saying nothing. They have to provide something. I uh, think I'm saying is that we couldn't do that. Like in our current bylaw, we do require a parking management plan and a parking utilization study. But I'm saying is if there's no requirement for parking, we can't say, we looked at your study, we think you're wrong, put in 20 spaces. I don't see the legal authority we have if there's a no parking requirement. Well, it says there's no minimum spaces as required in those sections of the bylaw. It's not saying that there's no parking required. So the building commissioner doesn't have a problem with you know, enforcing parking spaces here based on the language we, you know, we would insert. So I don't, I don't. So you don't think, you don't think Janet's concern is really real? Yeah, I mean, I think that if, um, you know, if we need to uh, change the language, I mean, we could say that, uh, you know, if she's worried about the no minimum, we could say they're, you know, like we just said that they're, um, with the following exceptions, you know, the parking, you know, the parking requirements of 700 to 7005 don't apply. I mean, we could change that language. Uh, and maybe that happens over the course of, say, the amendment, the zoning amendment process. But, you know, the time staff have met, the building commissioner hasn't had a concern with, an, you know, the ability to require parking. Okay. All right. Um, Fred. Uh, yeah, my. My hand went up first to suggest that uh, Nate's bullet points get incorporated into the motion as a friendly amendment. Uh, and I still suggest that. But I want to respond to the larger public policy issue that uh, Janet has raised. And, uh, and that is, uh, you know, we, we live in a market economy. And uh, anybody uh, spending the millions of dollars that's required to construct something that's going to go into this overlay uh, is certain to have made a careful study of what the market requires. And I don't think we have to get into this at this point. Uh, I like this just the way... Uh, uh, Nate is suggesting it by making sure that the uh, it appears in the leases and everything, so that uh, the uh, uh, the people who are going to be creating this understand they're going to have to be forthcoming about exactly what they've designed in terms of the market. And then I can't think of another place in town where uh, I'm comparatively less concerned about a, a uh, prescriptive requirement on parking than here where there is abundant uh, bus traffic and so forth. Uh, let's, uh, let's leave this to the market. Uh, I don't have a problem with that. And I, I am thoroughly in support of sending this forward. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Fred. Jesse. Yeah, I don't entirely disagree with Janet's point, but I guess I'm 
feeling like I would like to move it forward as is, knowing it's going to get scrutinized by many other people and come back, I would almost guarantee, with that as something to, that needs to be changed. I feel like there's no way it's going to go through council and CRC without this parking issue being addressed, without the 30% being, being brought up somehow, and then we're going to be dealing with it on that other end. And so to me, this is like, okay, let's make sure everyone's on board with the idea, and then we can hash out these details. That, that's that's the position I've sort of come to. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Bruce? Uh, I absolutely agree with you, Jesse. I, I think that uh, it will be interesting to see how this uh, discussion happens through the other committees that are going to be doing this. And so I'm, uh, apart from agreeing with you, Fred, I'm also agreeing with Jesse in the sense that I don't think uh, this is uh, derelict or anything close to dereliction, I think it's a, a constructive and healthy way to proceed. As comment number one, uh, if I can make comment number two. Uh, yes. uh, it's uh, it's really uh, to address uh, something that uh, we saw in a letter from Janet Keller, which was circulated and so forth. And we've said this before, but it seems to need to be repeated because uh, the concern is consistently being addressed. And that is... I think it's also not derelict of us to uh, 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 to to uh, leave any uh, uh, attempted uh, language related to wetlands and so forth in this bylaw because we've got a very active, very competent uh, conservation commission and a very uh, robust uh, state uh, wetlands protection act. So I don't think we have to in this bylaw or in this uh, this amendment to the bylaw address uh, concerns that will obviously be addressed by others uh, in parallel uh, with any development here. So I think that we're, we're comfortable. We read Janet's letter. We thought about it. I have. And I think uh, we don't need to uh, uh, include anything relative to that uh, area of concern in this uh, bylaw. OK. Um, so I'm going to, I wanted to ask a question of I guess it's of you, Bruce, because you made the motion. Um, you know, I was interested to know which of these two people prefer so, to, so that I could find out which one had more support. I am feeling a little bit boxed into a corner if I have to vote on one or the other first. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, if the first one passes, we'll never talk about the second one. Uh, uh, so I, yes. so I'm, I'm not happy with your motion, uh, Bruce. And, well, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, table do a poll of which one do you prefer and, and tally that up so that we, you know, I think one of these is going to move forward in some reasonably form close to what we've got here. And I don't know which one I want to have move forward tonight, um, based on which one has more support. Uh, um, I apologize. I uh, the five of us, uh, one of whom is not here, we uh, discussed this uh, for an hour and a half for Monday. Uh, but you and Johan, you and Johanna were not included in that, and so I'm. Uh, my motion was sensing the uh, mood of the Monday meeting, but uh, I apologize because you two were not in that, and so. You're right. I think I've probably uh, been a little preemptive. So what is the appropriate that I withdraw the motion or that I table the motion? Well, yeah, I guess um, I, I wonder how others feel about what I've said and whether they are willing to go that direction at least first. Um, and um, in that, if that's so, then I guess we could just withdraw the motion and we could do a sort of uh, a ask for a vote or a, an indication from each member present of which one they actually like better. That being the case, could I uh, uh, make a pitch for the next use, uh, not being part of having, having withdrawn the motion. Okay. And my, my pitch for mixed use is uh, because I did actually in that uh, housing committee, uh, in the housing subcommittee meeting, uh, right at the, I think the first, <laughs> the very beginning, I suggested that the preamble uh, uh, particularly of the misuse uh, um, uh, uh, draft, include a, a goal statement or a, a, there, is a, there is a goal statement uh, and uh, that we should add a, a sentence uh, 
at the end, which is almost a second short paragraph, which says that it is a it is the intention or the goal of this uh, Bible that uh, street life, the commercial retail street life on uh, University Drive be enhanced uh, or some version of that. Basically, something that states that we we value highly um, the uh, stimulation of uh, commercial and uh, uh, retail activity along that street. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so because of that, I uh, think that the mixed use uh, version is by far the more likely uh, to, to achieve that. And well, let's just say it's more likely to achieve that. And that's why I uh, personally would uh, favor that particular version. Okay. All right. So. Yeah. So sorry, just quickly, if, if that were the case, right, I think in the purpose section, there'd be an additional statement, right, that would read, you know, it could read, you know, it was also intended that the University Drive Overlay District expand retail and commercial vitality for year round use with street level services, pedestrian activity and vibrant amenities. So, you know, it would just reinforce the, the mixed use purpose. Uh, uh -huh. and that would be added. Okay. So, uh, Nate, is it your feeling that the uh, housing focused version is likely would permit and potentially result in more housing than the mixed use? Yeah, I mean, it, it would, right? Because on the interior of the corridor, you'd have, um, you know, I think the, given the market, the housing market, you'd probably have apartment buildings or social dormitories constructed. Uh, you know, the um, uh, Karin emailed me uh, this evening and said that, you know, speaking with an architect and a planner where she is, they she no longer feels too worried about six stories. Um, she was at the housing subcommittee. Um, and she said that, you know, they were saying, you know, think about mixed use in terms of the area or, you know, the neighborhood as opposed to building by building, think about like, okay, what, you know, what, what do you want in the area? Um, it doesn't really answer the question, but, you know, I, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, I think the idea would be though, if, if we had the housing focused one, uh, you know, you might not have the critical density right away. And if people jump to the middle, you know, you might all of a sudden then say, okay, someone might say, well, geez, where do we have the space to put other amenities. And maybe then that would happen. We'd actually have double, you know, two floors of non-residential and different buildings. But, um, you know, I think it's also important to have space for, you know, retail commercial office or whatever. And so I think that if, you know, the six floor is included, I think that the number of units or beds, I, I think about it as beds, the number of individuals that could be there is still, you know, much greater than is there now, right? So if originally the goal was, let's say, you know, I said 2000 beds, which, you know, is a lot, but say it's 1200, it's still gonna be impactful enough, I think, uh, to hopefully, you know, the housing subcommittee is talking about other um, ways that could, you know, zoning amendments or measures in other neighborhoods. So to me, it'd be like, okay, well, you know, this along with, you know, if we continue to talk to the university about say another P3 or something, and then Hadley, I, you know, my idea is like, okay, well, and you know, all of a sudden we could have, you know, 2000 more beds uh, for students, if we wanted to say that or just 2000 more beds in the market, and that's going to help a lot, right. And so that's kind of what we need. Um, so I'm not, you know, I, the more I think about it, it's like, you know, what, like, you know, I, I think even if mixed use is built and is vacant for a bit, maybe then it gets occupied because the next project put, brings in the density that you need to have, you know, that certain type okay. of retail or so commercial. You, you can and support so, both of these. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I am cognizant that it's 20 after nine and um, I don't know how long you guys want to stay up. But, uh, so I see Janet and then Johanna and then Jesse. So uh, we've heard from Bruce, he prefers the mixed use. I guess everybody who talks, could you please indicate your preference somewhere in your comments? Janet. Um, I prefer the mixed use version. Um, I would just, you know, support the motion. You know, my fear is like, you know, we're still up in the air about things. And, you know, if we send this to anybody, it's like, oh, the planning board agreed and thought this was best. And we're kind of saying, these are our concepts and we're kind of 
shifty, a little, you know, not sure of them. But anyway, pushing that aside, I would support the motion, which I may or may not be alive right now, is if we added 30% of the first floor in the be, be commercial or retail, and then adding a sentence to the parking that says, you know, the planning board can require the parking, the number of parking spaces to meet, can the planning board can require parking spaces to meet the needs of the users of the building. Like I need something that will let the planning board add spaces. And I think that sen sentence will be like, because I think the way the saying we're not going to, there's no minimum requirement is saying there's no requirement of any parking. And I think I want to some line that says that we have the legal authority to require parking spaces to meet the needs of users of the building. And we'll base that on the study and the management plan and what we, you know, what, what the building is doing. So I think I would support this with the 30%, adding 30% of the first floor and a sentence that gives us the authority to put parking spaces into the project. Otherwise, I just don't think we have the lever. Lever? I, I... All right, thank you. Um, Johanna, you're the next hand. So if you could say whether you, which of the two you prefer as written and whether you are supporting either of Janet's proposals. Um. I appreciate the work that the housing group did um, and I appreciated the kind of summaries. I feel like there are still more like pros and cons that I'm interested in. So like one gets more housing. What about the revenue numbers? Like which one is likely to get us more revenue as a town? And it seems to me like both of them could lead to a like walkable, bikeable, vibrant streetscape. Um, so I think, um, you know, I've always been the advocate of like mixed use and part of it and allow for apartments in other parts of it. I still think that flexibility is helpful, but if I need to choose, I think I would support mixed use, um, over how the housing oriented one although it's a thin margin for me. Um, I am comfortable with the broader parking language that Nate suggested. So I don't, I, I don't feel a need to tighten that part at this time. And then what was the second thing? Whether to add the 30% first floor or just leave it with the 75% of the linear frontage. I'm okay with the 75% linear frontage. Okay. All right. So that's a preference for mixed use and pretty much as drafted rather than with the amendments that Janet proposed. Okay. Yeah. Although they wouldn't be a deal breaker for me either. Okay. Jesse. Thanks. Um, I favor the mixed use version. Uh, my main rationale for that is I feel like if we don't, do that now or don't try and accomplish that, it will never happen there. It will be all just non-commercial entities that happen, except at the corner spots, if that's what gets required. So I, I very much favor all mixed use. I'm okay with the 75%. I also, though, agree with Janet that we need, I like your proposal, so I would totally support that. I do think the planning board should have some teeth and some ability to say, no, we don't think you put enough parking and have it be a, a, with each proposal that comes in, have that ability. So I would support that completely. All right. Uh, Fred. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I support mixed use because of the revenue picture. And uh, I want to be very sure that we don't end up with something that uh you know if we if we build it they don't come and i would prefer to leave that to the market i don't think it's necessary for us to uh, have that specific review okay all right thank you uh, so, yeah. i guess um i really could go either way on these two uh but i'm 
perfectly happy to go along with the mixed use. Um, I don't, I, I, I would rather see the 75% of the linear frontage rather than going to the 35, 30% 30 first floor. I think that will um, be more palatable for folks, for the developers or whoever's building, trying to build a building. Um, and um, I don't want to have to have each developer necessarily need to provide all the parking for their residents. Um, I, it'd be fine with me if somewhere along this stretch behind a building there was a parking garage and that everybody got to use it or whatever. Um, or there, you know, I, I don't, I, I'd rather just let the market figure that out. Um, as, as Fred said, especially in this location where um, there's good public transit, it's a level topography up to UMass, and there are reasonably abundant services right in that vicinity with the post office and the grocery store and the healthcare across the street. So um, I, if there's anywhere in town you don't need a car, it's probably this area. So, all right. So um, with, with that, oh, okay, uh, Nate, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think, um... For the parking piece, I would uh, add a bullet that an applicant shall be required to submit uh, one, a parking utilization study and two, a parking management plan in order for the permit granting authority to determine that an adequate number of off street parking spaces are provided. Um, I have that typed out. And then I would, in the is, bullet- Is, there, is um, there something that, like we have to accept it? Well, so, you know, what we're asking that what that bullet is saying is that, a, you know, a developer would have to, they're probably going to do it anyways, a utilization study and a management plan. And then they're going to talk about that with the, with the planning board during permitting. And so what, 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 the, what they could say is that, well, in our management plan, yeah, we're going to say in our leases, we don't have parking or that we have a shared agreement with the other property owner or that, you know, we're going to have bike storage. And, you know, so to me, that becomes part of the discussion during permitting, but we're, we're requiring that they submit those two documents for that discussion. So the board understands, you know, here's what they're saying. Okay, we have, you know, 3000 square feet of commercial space. Here's what we're thinking. Okay, here's what we think a, a right amount of parking is given that, you know, we're gonna have three different spaces. We need, you know, 75 parking spaces there. They're gonna be, you know, shared at night by the residents, but that's the kind of information that the applicant would be required to provide. It's not saying what the right number is. They're they're going to you know say it. Um, and then I think in the current amendment, we say there shall be no minimum requirements. I think we say that the parking standards in Article Seven shall apply with the following exceptions. The first bullet could just say, um, you know, sections, you know, um, omitting section seven through seven point zero five. And then shared parking. So we we remove the language for minimums so that it's not confusing. And then we have that second bullet about or the bullet about you know they're provided to um, required to provide those two documents. And so that gives the board the ability to understand what they think is the parking uh, you know needs and demand for the project. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Bruce. Um. Uh, Doug, I was going to uh, make a motion. Yep. But I think, I, I think, yeah, we got through my request for preferences, and I think that was pretty conclusive. Um, but the question is, do you want to take public comment before I make a motion or after? Um, I don't have a preference, but I'm happy to do that right now if, if you want to wait. Yes, why don't you do that? We've okay. got two uh yeah, we possible. only have three members of the public, um, so uh, those of you who are still with us, uh, do would you like? Would any of you like to make a public comment before we uh, have a motion to move forward with one of these proposals? Uh, I see a hand from Janet Keller. Pam, could we bring Janet over? Hello, hello, Janet. If you could uh, give us your name and your street address. 
Sure, Janet Keller, um, 120 Pope of the Hill Road. Um, there were two things I forgot to say in my email um, today, and I want to say them now. And the first is I appreciate the thought and hard work that the staff and the board members have devoted to this work. Um, the second um, is that um, I support rezoning University Drive to increase housing and raise revenue. Um, so, and I still think it's important to provide clear reg uh, regulation. So I'm um, happy that um, you uh, are discussing, and I don't pretend to know the full implications of them, um, but uh, a, a little bit more specificity for the parking requirements. Um, I, I, um, I still think it's a, um, I hear you thinking that it will be mainly students and that they won't need it, but I think it's important to um, retain the ability for other people to live there as well. And they're gonna need parking um, and, and people who are shopping are gonna need par parking. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, second hand from Jennifer Tao. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Jennifer. Oh, I'm on. Okay. I'm Jennifer Taub. I live on Lincoln Avenue and I am completely speaking as a resident. Um, and I echo Janet that um, I appreciate all the hard work and um, support this overlay for University Drive. I just wanted to offer the comment as a resident who lives about three blocks from campus where there's a lot of um, student housing that's occupied by students. And even though we are very close to campus, in my neighborhood, I see one one car per student in every you know, single family home or eight cars if it's a duplex. And that students don't have car bring cars to Amherst so much to get to class because they can certainly walk to class from uh, my neighborhood, but that's how they get from their hometowns to Amherst. So I, um, you know, appreciate, I guess, Nate's suggestion that, and what Janet has been saying, that there be some um, language or mechanism in the bylaw that doesn't read as though parking is not required, because as easy access as there is by public transportation or foot from University Avenue to campus, the non-students will very likely have cars and students will probably have cars because that's how they get back and forth from their hometowns here. So that's my only comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jen. All right. I do not see that the third person wants to raise their hand and make a public comment. So um, I, I guess we'll move back, Bruce, to you. Uh, you said you were ready to make a motion. I do see that Janet has her hand up following you. Um, well, the motion will be that uh, the uh, board uh, proposed to town council an over, uh, a mixed use overlay district as drafted um, with, uh, uh, and I would like to, to uh, with, the addition, with the addition of the following. One, um, the uh, the, ext the extension to the goal statement, uh, Nate, as you stated it, your statement was better than mine. I mean, better than what I wrote you in email, I think. Number two uh, is that uh, there be additional two bullets uh, in uh, related to parking. Again, uh, you read you you read them out, uh, and I would add those two. And and at the moment, I Janet, I won't add. Uh, uh, your statement, I I don't disagree with it, but I I I think it uh, it, uh, it it doesn't seem to be the, the body of the, the mind of the the majority here. 
So I will, uh, that will be the motion. Mixed okay. use, overlay, goal statement, two bullets on parking. And the two bullets are requirement of the utilization study and a parking management plan. I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. And so that's the motion. Okay. Um, Janet, do you want to second that? Uh, you are muted, actually. You're the next hand, I see. Um, I'm a little confused about the the add-ons. So here's the am I if my screen's visible or the screen's visible, yeah. I don't know if it's legible, but under the purpose section, we'd have a statement uh, that reads, it is also intended that the University Drive Overlay District expand retail and commercial vitality for year-round use with street level services, pedestrian activity, and vibrant amenities. Okay. Um, and then the the follow the, the two changes on the parking are, parking, are we change the change the first parking bullet instead of saying the no minimum requirements, we'd say section 7.000 through 7.05 shall not apply. And then the second change would be a new bullet. An applicant shall be required to submit a parking utilization study and a parking management plan in order for the permit granting authority to determine that an adequate number of off-street parking spaces are provided. Okay. Bruce, is that consistent with your motion? It is. Okay, then I'll just go ahead and second that at this point. Um, and then at that point we can, Janet, you have your hand up. Did you wanna speak at this point? Okay. All right, so we have a motion, we have a second. The time is 9.37 <laughs> and uh, nobody else has their hand up. Are we, are we done talking about this for right now? All right, I'm seeing some yeses and some thumbs up. Um, okay, well, um, in that case, without further ado, um, we can, go through this, uh, starting Bruce with you. How do you vote on your motion? Aye. All right. Fred? Aye. Jesse? Aye. Um, Janet? Vote oh, aye with reservations. I don't think it will show anywhere, but. Okay. And I'm an aye as well. So we have five votes in favor, two, two you, members. You need time. Johanna. Did I skip you, Maha Johanna? You did, and that's okay. We can oh, do me no. now. I'm an I. <laughs> I checked you off. I don't know how I did that. Okay. So <laughs> I thank you. All right. So five, five in favor, two of two against, or two absent. And so that passes. So Chris, um, um, first of all, Nate, thanks for all your work on this. It's been a long process. Um, Chris, uh, does this board need to do anything further or do you take care of transmitting this to town council? We'll take care of transmitting it to town council. All right. All right. Great. So the time now is 9.39. I guess we can move on. Um, uh, item seven on the agenda was old business not anticipated. Do we have any, Chris or Pam? I don't believe so. No. Uh, likewise that. for new business? I don't think we do. No. No. Okay. Oh, um, uh, except to say that um, we're, we do have the five uh, people that we asked for for the july 24th meeting so i'm um, mm -hmm. thinking that we will hold the july 24th meeting with regard to the jones library so that's new business i guess okay all right okay. um form a and r subdivision applications there is one great and i will do my best to bring it up this is the one that was in the packet right yes oh good it's very straightforward 
consolidation of lots? Yes. Okay. Sorry, bear with me. I can bring up the GIS map first. I don't know if I have much voice left, um, but so this is at 374 Flat Hills Road. One owner owns these three parcels right here, one, two, and three. And they would like to combine these three parcels into one. It's that straightforward. Here's the plan. All right. So you would be agreeing that this does not rise to the level of um, having to go through the subdivision mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And that you would authorize Mr. Marshall to sign the document. Okay. Um, I had one question as to whether that narrow strip parcel in the center uh, contains an easement to access the Coles property that's to the to the top of the page. And would this affect the Coles easement if it exists at all? No, it doesn't affect the easement. Okay. So there there is an easement? I, if there were an easement, it wouldn't affect the easement. Okay. All right. Fine. Janet. I had a question about that strip too. Like how did it just how did it come to be? Like I mean maybe maybe you don't know that, but it just seems so odd. I assume it was held, you know, created by the by Coles or whoever owned that upper parcel as a way to get just as a to preserve an access, but that's total conjecture. Paul Paul Jones used to do that. He did that with us a bit. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the current owners have owned it since the early 80s, all three properties. And so I think it was probably the other year they came to town hall and they were asking questions. I mean, that's not even a legal lot anymore, but I think it's a, you know, it's like a vestigial lot. Um, probably right. Probably was an access at one point, but you know, like I said, they've owned it for 40 years. And so the recommendation is to consolidate it because, um, you know, it, their interests are probably merged anyways for some purposes, but from the, you know, the legal standpoint, it's still three lots, but it'll be okay. cleaner if it's one. All right. So I, Chris, am I right? You usually just ask, does anybody object to mm -hmm. us having me sign this? We don't, do right. a, yep. we don't typically do a formal vote. Nope. All right. So does anybody object? <laughs> I don't see anybody objecting. Okay. All right, Chris, I guess we'll make an appointment to meet in the back lot. Hopefully on the day when it's not raining. Right. Okay, upcoming ZBA applications. Oh, well, gosh. Um, do you want I would just mention two things, and that would be the fact we've talked about the comprehensive B project that you um, I had the presentation for, if you remember, it was at 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belchertown Road. Um, and that project did receive their project eligibility approval. And I believe there was a pre-permitting um, meeting today. Is that right, colleagues? Yes. Yes. So that's all I had to say about that. And then I also would have to refer to my colleagues. I know the spoke is coming forward um, to ZBA, but I don't have any details to what that is. So other than that, I don't have anything to mention. The Spoke has two venues currently. They have one on East Pleasant Street and they have one on Prey Street. So the application is for the um, venue that's on East Pleasant Street. And they're hoping to enhance the front patio area. They're gonna add two forms of egress and put a um, an awning over 
over mm -hmm. it. It's not really an awning. It's more like a roof structure. Um, mm -hmm. So they're just going to enhance that area and they're going to the Zoning Board of Appeals to get permission to do that. Okay. Did All we right. previously talk about Lane Quarry, Pam? I thought we did last time, which is why okay. I didn't bring it up. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And Black Walnut, too. Black Walnut. Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Any SPP, SBR, and SUB applications? Oh, we have the Jones Library coming in on July 24th to talk to you about their changes to um, to meet their budget. They're going to be eliminating some things and changing some things. So they need to come back to you. And then um, Barry Roberts project, um, currently we have it slated for coming to you on August 7th. Um, and we understand that Mr. Marshall won't be here that night. And so... Um, so Johanna can preside. Johanna can, can preside. All right. Is that all for the, that category? I think so. All right. Uh, time is 946. Um, planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, anything for PVPC? Yes, the, one of the quarterly meetings happened uh, a week or two ago, and uh, there was a, a, a comprehensive presentation by a guy named Ken Comia from the Commonwealth. He was presenting on uh, energy infrastructure siting and permitting, and he was basically briefing uh, uh, the various uh, towns and so forth, the, or the representatives of the various towns on that. Um, this is something that Janet knows a lot about and uh, and and because of that we've been uh, introduced occasionally from her updates and so forth but uh, there was some uh, um, pre presentation materials that were uh, submitted uh, and I could pass them uh, Nate uh, uh, Chris if you like uh, so that they could be distributed to, just so that you could have access uh, uh, in in your files to uh, current thinking about this and where the state are headed, it's it's basically the the state are heading to enact mm -hmm. uh, um, some kind of consolidation, uh, and uh, they've learned a fair bit over the recent years, and so there there some of that learning is being uh, folded into state legislation, and that was what this was all about. Um, I think. Um, that's mostly what was there. There was some presentations about what the PVC, what the PVPC has accomplished, and so forth in recent, uh, in the, in the first part of the year, in the past year. But I will uh, send Chris the uh, the three documents that I grabbed uh, from that presentation. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Um, I. For CPAC, uh, CPAC was reconvened sometime in the last month. Um, we were asked to release some limitations on funding for the high school track and field uh, reconstruction. Uh, the, the two requirements that we did release were for artificial turf and that the track and field be reoriented in a north-south direction. So we no longer have those uh, at least we didn't. We were asked to recommend to council that those be really be uh, removed as as limitations on the funding. So we did that. Um, uh, Karen is not here for DRB. Uh, Chris, anything on CRC? Yes. Um... We're continuing to talk to CRC about the solar bylaw, but we haven't done it in a while because the CRC has been engaged in another business um, and they did interview um, potential members of the planning board and um, they did recommend Mr. Marshall and um, Ms. Ferris for uh, to the town council to be um, planning board members. Um, and then the other thing is that um, sometime in July, Nate and I will be meeting with the CRC to present um, what we're doing with um, the downtown design guidelines and what's the other project name? 
<laughs> my my brain is escaping me. It was the overlay, but maybe that'll get to them anyways. Oh, the overlay. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we we've been asked to explain those two um, those two projects to the CRC, and I think that's it. Okay. Uh, well, since it's report of chair, I will say I will add to what you said, Chris. Um, CRC has voted to extend the current appointments of Janet and me beyond June 30th to, I believe, Chris, isn't it like J July 15th when they have their yeah. meeting where they are going to vote on uh, appointing new members, essentially, to replace our two positions? That's correct. And those are, those recommendations are the two people you mentioned. Um, so uh, I guess do we have a meeting? In we do do we? When's our next meeting? Well, I think our next meeting is July seventeenth, but I'm not sure that we have any business um, okay. for the mm -hmm. agenda. But we so this may be Janet's last meeting and we would like to thank her for all of her hard work mm -hmm. and um, participating these many years in the planning board. Has it been two full terms, six years, Janet? Been It's been five years. I think I was two years and then three years, but it's okay. it's aged me, but it's really, I, I'm ha happy to do it. I hope I helped a bit and didn't irritate people too much, but I, I appreciate all the crazy hard work we do, you know? Mm -hmm. And nobody gets paid, really. None of us, except for Pam and and Chris and Nate. Which I get the feeling these hours that these late hours aren't really paid. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I appreciate everybody else's work too. So thank, thank you, you, Janet. You're welcome. Thank you. Will, uh, will we see you on another committee soon? You know, I don't know if I have any committees. I might just retire to the Eric Carl Art Room. <laughs> yeah. which I, I do two, twice a month so all right well i know there's some committee vacancies elsewhere in the town oh well, that's true okay so, so you that... all have, may i just um talk about upcoming meetings i mean well maybe it's report of chair time and then i'll make the report of staff well, I made my report. Uh, I just wanted to mention that we were extended, but it turns out we're it's an extension without any practical benefit because we don't have a meeting in the first half of June or I think July. That's right. July. Yeah. So the July third meeting is canceled. I'm thinking of asking you if we should cancel the July seventeenth meeting unless we slot something in there. I think we could barely get our. We could barely get Barry Roberts' project in if we put out a um, mm -hmm. a legal ad on Friday. So mm -hmm. maybe I should talk to Pam about that, and that would allow us to have Mr. Marshall on that um, case. So I I will be out of the office for the rest on the of the seventeenth. Uh, no, when your legal ad is due. That's Friday. right. Yeah. So Friday. I could I could submit the legal ad, mm -hmm. but. Um, mm -hmm. And you're out of the office tomorrow, too. Maybe I'll talk to Rob about whether we should have the public hearing on the 17th instead of the, what would it be? It would have been on August 7th. So I'll do that tomorrow. So is everybody um, available on the 17th? Mm -hmm. as, far as, as far as I know. OK. Good. Well, we might do that, but that would mean two meetings in a row. It would mean meeting on the 17th about Barry Roberts' project and then meeting on the 24th about the um, Jones uh, Library. Chris, this is Johanna. I have a conflict on the 17th. Okay. I will say that the Barry Roberts project has not submitted to the Conservation Commission. That's it's right. It's a pretty important review on that property. So, it might, you know. So, there's no real rush on it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right, we'll talk about that internally tomorrow. Okay. All right. Great. Well, uh, is that it for your report, Chris? I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you all, especially Janet. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're going to miss mm -hmm. us on Wednesday nights. <laughs>
I might come. I might do some public commenting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, stay away. Okay. Have a good Fourth of July, and we'll see you sometime in July. Fifty-five. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.